Chapter One of Goose Quill Papers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Cantoni. Goose Quill Papers by Louise Imogen Guiney. On the Good Repute of the Apple. For the sake of an apple, Atalanta lost her nigh won victory and that other apple, thrown for the fairest, moved all Olympus into discord. Bragi, the north god, and his peers renewed their youth with one touch of its cool juices. Dragons circled it in the enchanted garden, the daughters three stood about it in a sacred ring, and none but Hercules was its captor. The renaissance marbles of the Greeks are dug out of earth, praxitalian shapes, with its rounded beauty yet in their outstretched hands. What a superb mythologic pedigree! What noble mention, each worth an immortality, from old poets, romancers, historians! All heterodoxy lauded thee, apple of mine eye. It was reserved for true church traditions to belie thee. Thou who art full of virtue, what is this rumor of thy defection in Eden? thy remote causing of all contemporaneous woe. Thou who art fair without as a cherub's cheek, how couldst thou be a better to the treacherous spirit? Shall the fault of our frail ancestress rest upon thy rosy head? That the forbidden fruit of paradise was an apple, saith a grave and learned author, is commonly believed, confirmed by tradition, perpetuated by writings, verses, pictures, and some are so bad prosodians as thence to derive the Latin word malum, because that fruit was the first occasion of evil, wherein, notwithstanding determinations are presumptuous, many, I perceive, are of another belief. Let the personal argument stand in default of a bolder plea. Mephisto, who hath had no chance of reformation, and who may be supposed to keep his early leanings, is in modern times no frequenter of orchards. Not by farmer, nor wayside knight, nor loitering sweethearts at dusk, hath he ever been detected prowling about an innocent apple tree. It hath, on the other hand, been affirmed by an ingenious clerk that apple-eating is a masculine passion, and that no woman hath a dominating natural relish for this hearty fruit which, proven, would seem to indicate, as a burnt child dreads the fire, according to the proverb, that Eve's mindful daughters shun by instinct the immemorial enemy. If, indeed, it needs must be demonstrated by some unborn logician that our primal happiness was forfeited by naught else beyond the serpent's wiles than a gilly-flower or a greening hanging on the representative tree and criterion of obedience, then there exist myriads of her descendants with the ancestral weakness who shall look on our abused common mother with a new and tender consideration such as her disastrous connection with a plum or a currant or a quince could never have evoked. The apple is the only fruit which deserveth the name of genial. A peach is but a Capuan dish. The lime approacheth with cold infrequency. The amiable pear hath too little character. The grape is chiefly suggestive, anticipatory of its hereafter, as the larva of the gorgeous butterfly but apple standeth on her own merits. Tart, jelly, fritters, dumpling, enter not into the imagination of her possessor. Nay, nor even cider, that fretful disempurpled wine, wine, as it were, with the bar sinister. Apple hath not the flippant gaiety of the cherry. Her glad humor is somewhat dashed with cynicism, she warmeth the heart, and trippeth up the tongue, and is, in the accepted phrase of artists, a good fellow, foe to unrighteous melancholy, as Laurentius writ, and frankly compassionate. She should have had Horace for her court poet. One can conceive of poor manly fielding, loving her at the modest ratio of three dozen a day, and of little Mr. Pope 
brushing her aside with fastidious petulance. The friends of Apple, your sworn familiars, who offend not her sun-mottled exterior with barbaric divisions of the knife, may be known by their ready wit and their bright glances. Hath not the wholesome autumn light, which filtered into the fruit they affect, permeated their moral temperament? They must needs be sound, consolatory, humane, and fit to wrestle with every wind that blows. Man is that he eats, we read among the bewilderments of German speculation. But of her chaste and subtle cup, rimmed with gold or crimson, as nature willed, the elect drink invigoration. Encompass me about with apples, saith the canticle, for I am sick with love, which, driven to its bare and literal sense, implies that apples are antidotes to languor and over-fondness. Apple, be it said, is a platonist. Bake her not. Take her in her gypsy wildness, in the homespun, lovelier so than pomegranates in their velvet. Not too untimely, either, lest she be vindictive and become the apothecary's friend rather than thine. Learn to trace her maiden growth among her cheery sisters from some gnarled seat. Deny her not the armchair with thee before the flickering hearth-fire, and in thy most solitary meditations, thy rapt brooding hours, trust her that she shall not distract thee. Out of celestial gardens, in the tender Cappadocian legend, made Dorothy's angel brought apples to Theophilus, to him, indeed, the fruit of salvation. Yet, having lost the sweet symbolic grace of yore, she comes ever benignly and without malice. Lavish October's legacy, foretelling to thy fancy other seasons yet to make glad the earth, she, more than any other, is the staunch standby, the winter friend. Her native orchards droop lifelessly in snows, but like a fair deed she surviveth mortality, a kind and vital influence still. Darling of the tourist and the huntsman that she is, never was their creature so absolutely adapted to the student. Her happy moisture fructifieth the brain. Only our neighboring Concord sages, far back in the Athenian beginnings of the present school, sought her intellectual aid in vain. They and the listening element met for conversation. Emerson, Thoreau, Alcott, Curtis, even Hawthorne, with his sylvan shyness about him. There were appalling breaks, pertinacious flashes of silence, such as were indigenous to Macaulay. The philosopher sat erect and struggled. Then the narrator tells us how, with Olympic sweetness, the host, Ralph Waldo Emerson, brought out a dish of russets, magna space altera, genius having failed, which were consumed unavailingly in silence. The ally was wistfully courted on after occasions, but the club solemnly dispersed on the third night. If Apple, alas, hath her freaks, let them be expended on philosophers. For her humbler adherents, she hath too constant a good will. To us, at least, she is faithful, recompensing our old affection for every branch of her house. We are no specialist, but cherish her to the twentieth remove. All her pale and soured graftings, her pungent windfalls, her eccentric hangers-on, her disregarded poor relations. Yea, till our judgment and our gallantry forsake us, be thou our deity, Pomona. Candles we'll give to thee, and a new altar. Nothing shall divert our vow. Willfully and in cold blood we subscribe ourself thy pagan. End of chapter 1 Recording by Linda Cantoni Chapter 2 of Goose Quill Papers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit 
LibriVox.org. Goose Quill Papers by Louise Imogen Guiney. Chapter 2 A Hand. It would be a judicious pastime for some curious scholar to write up the antecedents and traditions of these ten ubiquitous digits with which nature dowers most of us. A survey reaching from the crime that darkened the morning of the world, the handiwork of Cain, to the most delicate outcome of art, finished yesterday. A summary of all the vicissitudes and symbolisms connected with the hand and its doings, challenges, investitures, perjuries, salutations, the science of chiromancy that the Romans loved, records made by chisel or pen by Michelangelo. Gorta, Palestrina, of gloves and rings and falcon chesses, of armour buckled on by saddened sweethearts, and prizes bestowed at tourneys, of power in the soldier, and persuasiveness in the fair lady, of eastern juggling, and missile illuminations in grey cells, and manuscripts folded and preserved through centuries, of pickers and stealers, and money getting associations, seizures, bestowals and benedictions. The Dutch boy, stopping in a dike with his frozen thumb in times of flood, shall not be forgotten. Nor that maid of honour, who, with her slender wrist, bolted the door against the raging mob of revolutionists. Undauntedly long, and at last vainly, and in the chapter of heroisms, shall be found the patient pyramid builders, and Musius Scavola, unflinching in fire, how, with his hand, Attila made kings tremble. Xerxes scourged the sea, and a saint of old Assisi won bird and beast from solitude, to feed and be caressed. We bethink us lastly of antique instruments, old tapestries, intaglios, and rare lamps. Of the child Christopher Wren, raising card houses, and forecasting the stone glories of London, or of Petrarch, roving in a dusty world of books, and so dying, suddenly, and without pain, with his arm about them, as of things among those which our historians shall touch. Scarce any author, save Sir Thomas Brown, hath thought it worth while to spend learned discussion on the right and the left hand. Yet it is a peculiar schism we graft on a youngling's mind, when we teach it to discard the good services and ready offices of its honest, sinistral member, so that we may come to look upon a left-handed neighbour as a sort of natural protest against an ill custom and a vindication of unjustly suppressed forces. A hand clinched, a hand outstretched, have in them all of defiance and supplication. Hospitality shines in a hand preferred, a frank hand as the moor saith. Like a shell turned from the light, but with the tints of the morning not yet faded from it, is a babe's hand, tip-tilted, lovely, as if it should close on nothing ruder than a flower. The bronzed hands of toil, the opaque hands of idleness, differing even as life and death, the dear, remembered, cordial hands of one's youth. Shall they not have their laureate also in the commentator that is to be, this new philosopher in trifles, this student of the furthest and subtlest bodily activities, and chronicler, as it were, in extremis? The hand betrays the heart, not to thee, obstreperous gypsy, with thy sapient lifelines, but even to the unchrismed eye of the laity. We detect good nature in yon plump matron, because of that pudgy but roseate part of her appended to a Tuscan bracelet, good nature and generosity and simple faith. We have close acquaintance with courageous hands, melancholy hands, avaricious hands, compassionate hands, fastidious hands, hands sensitive and fair, friends to all things gentle and pulsing with intelligence. We read in this hand how it hath healed a bitter wound, and in that how it hath locked the door against a cry. Have we not known hands dark and shrunken with age or suffering, instinct yet with so-called patrician blood? 
the memory comes over us of the prince. Such was verily his meek title. From a far isle, the inscrutable Asiatic, acclimated in speech and dress, whose chilling touch, recording icicles in midsummer, we superstitiously evaded at meeting and parting, and over whose origin we sun lovers made jests, in the halls of that dreaming hair of a later dynasty, Madame B. It was the boast of Job that he had not kissed his hand in sign of worship to sun, nor moon, nor stars. Note the pertinent and noble metaphor of Banquo to express reliance and rest in time of perplexity. In the great hand of God I stand. To what fopperies, what wild freaks of medieval years hath the pliant hand lent itself? To the triangles, stars, portraits of ancient calligraphic cunning, to the wig, shaped facetious, embodying a request to the barber, or to the heart, dolphin, and true love knot that reveal the swain's metrical size to the scrutinising eyes of Phyllis. Peace to those old minimizers, to him, the spider worker, whose elfin Iliad Cicero saw, packed miraculously in a nutshell, to sturdy Peter Bales, that did so take Eliza, with his infinitesimal tracery, which the Lion Queen delighted to read through a mighty glass, holding his airy volume on her thumbnail. Disraeli the Elder tells us of the pleasing origin of that modern phrase, to write like an angel, gracefully derived from one Angela Vergesio, a scribe who drifted to Paris under Francis I, and whose name became, in time, a synonym for beautiful calligraphy. To write like an angel, now, with due allowance of the possession among celestial beings of our poor terrain accomplishments, yet may angels themselves most solemnly and securely preserve us from the foregoing solecism, saving the primordial Angelo, a legend incorporated. None do so much write like angels as that slave trader, the writing master, enemy, and subjugator of the hand's natural freedom. Handwriting, that should be a matter of separate mental habit and muscular action, as Hartley Coleridge averred, the writing master artificializes into a set form. A young lady is to write so, a clerk so. There is a rascally supposed respectability in keeping to this masquerade, where revelations of individuality are never in order. Spectre of our childhood, bugbear of ambrosial years, tyrant, nay, what can we call thee worse than thou art in bare English? Copybook! The faithfulest vow of our life, religious as Hannibal's was against thee. We recall with an alterable haughtiness that not for one moment did we tolerate thee, save under burning protest, that thy long-drawn de capo moralities, all letter and no spirit, made our soul shudder, that every hour at the desk of old, under thy correct staring eye, was an hour of scorn and insurrection, and that we celebrate daily thine anniversary and thy festival, after our own heart, in cherishing every irregularity that thy Puritan code abhorreth. Ay, tales and quirks are dear to us, and we fear not to send forth our tea without his bar, our eye without her dot lest we should seem reconciled to thine atrocious ritual. We shake our enfranchised hand in thy face, thou stereotyped impostor. We are not of misanthropic habit, but we reserve a sentiment warm as York's against Lancaster, or a right Carlist's towards the mild usurping race of Spain. For that fellow mortal, whose traceries in ink and pencil are sealed with orthodoxy, by the accepted wretchedness of their capitals, the moral depravity of their loop letters, we choose our friends, the least erring, the least dear. We cannot abide Giotto because of his O that had no blemish. We take solace and delight in that exquisite Janus jest of the last Bourbon Louis, who, re-entering his palace, the imperial initial everywhere above and beside him, said, with a light shudder, to one of his blood, Voila, the enemy autour de nous. 
not for all the authority of divine prudence herself, shall we be mindful of our P's and Q's. A flourish, not indeed the martial blare of trumpets, but the misguided capers of a pen point, we look upon as a cardinal, yea, if we may proportion adjectives to our grade of feeling, a pontifical sin. Character demonstrates itself in trifles. Washington wrote with a clearness and deliberation, like a lawmaker. Rufus Choate, intricately and whimsically, like a wit. Aldice runs down the list of English royal autographs, drawing no inferences, and sets solely on his fact. Cromwell's signature is paradoxically faint and vacillating. Elizabeth writ an upright hand, a large tall character. James I, in an ungainly fashion, all awry. Charles I, an Italian hand, the most correct of any prince we ever had. Charles II, a little, fair, running, uneasy hand. Such, adds a commentator, as we might expect from that illustrious vagabond, who had much to write, often in odd situations, and never could get rid of his natural restlessness and vivacity. It goes somewhat hard with us that Porson, Young, and especially Thackeray wielded a proper quill, and were prone to consider penmanship as one of the fine arts. Nevertheless, we take it that Mr. Joseph Surface, in a comedy, would write so as to gladden the hurtes root of a schoolmistress, as likewise might our honest friend Iago, item that Homer's mark was but a hen scratch, outdone in his own day by the most time out of mind stroller that sang Eilis with him. No missionary, fretting over the innocent rascalities of Afric tribes, burns with holier wrath than seizes us on beholding the prospectus of the Penman's Gazette. Hark to its beguiling philippics. Good penmanship hath made fortunes. Every year thousands are advanced by it to position and liberal salaries, students making it a speciality. It is worth more than all the Greek and Latin, but the antiquated rubbish of the higher schools and colleges. For, thine exquisite reason, dear knight, for it yields prompt and generous returns in money, food, clothing, good associations and incentives to usefulness in the world. The gentle reader is to imagine money in huge capitals and the other rewards of merit dwindling successively, till the incentives to usefulness are scarce visible to the naked eye. And then, forsooth, one is encouraged periodically by the fish-like portraits of famous penmen. Have a care, have a care, little guileless abecedarian, lest thy physiognomy, some black morning, should lend its beauty to the procession of fiends who write like angels. Whom shall we hire to shout from the housetops, vehemently, and with chaotic disinterestedness, that success should be won through ambitions, a trifle exclusive of money, food and clothing, and that this new heraldry of hands, not hearts, is a monstrous error? Who is there to heed that strange doctrine? Think into what grave parley we may be drawn, even by the silken string of the Penman's Gazette, into what resentment of an unheavenly lesson, but we forbear. A century closes at the fingertips of two men of unequal age, and every touch of palm to palm forges a link of the unseen social chain which connects us with the father of our race. We take in ours, with enthusiastic consciousness, a hand we honour, or a hand that by representation has, perhaps, held cordially that of the great of old. So chance we to strike across the gulf of time into the grasp of Cadamon, the Saxon beginner, or the real Roland of the Horn, or Plato, or Alcuin, or him of Salzburg, the sunniest-hearted maker of music. Neither in our speculations can we forget that a hand not all of earth rested once upon childish heads in Galilee, and passed among vast crowds, forgiving, healing, and doing good. And we know not but that our meanest brother, coming as a stranger, may bring to us in more ways than one its transmitted benediction. End of chapter 2
Chapter Three of Goose Quill Papers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Goose Quill Papers by Louise Imogen Guinea. An Open Letter to the Moon. To the Celestial and My Soul's Idol, the Most Beautified. It might appear to us an imperative, though agreeable duty, most high and serene, madam, to waft towards you occasionally a transcript of our humble doings on this nether planet, were we not sure, in the matter of friendly understanding, that we opened correspondence long ago. You were one of our earliest familiars. You stood in that same office to our fathers and mothers, back to your sometime contemporary, Adam of the Garden. And while we are worried into acquiescence with years, cares, wrinkles, and such inevitable designs of age, we are more pleased than envious to discover that you grow never old to the outward eye, and that you appear the same lovesome Lady Bright as when we first stared at you from a child's pillow. You are acquainted, not by hearsay, but by actual evidence with our family history, having seen what sort of figure our ancestors cut, and being infinitely better aware of the peculiarities of the genealogical shrub than we can ever be. Therefore we make no reference to a matter so devoid of novelty, but we do mean to frankly free our mind on the subject of your ladyship's own behavior. We take this resolve to be no breach of that exalted courtesy which befits us no less than you in your skyward station. We have in part lost our ancient respect for you, a sorry fact to chronicle. There were once various statements floating about our cradle, complimentary to your supposed virtues. You were Phoebe, twin to Phoebus, goddess excellently bright, a queen having a separate establishment, coming into a deserted court by night, and kindling it into more than daytime revelry. You were an enchantress the tutelary divinity of water sprites and greensward fairies your presence was indispensable for felicitous dreams to be moonstruck then meant to be charmed inexpressibly to be lifted off our feet now we allow that you may have suffered by misrepresentation or else are we right in detecting your arts for by all your starry handmaidens you are not what we took you to be we are informed our quondam faith in you almost beshrews the day we learn to read that you are a timid dependent only of the sun afraid to show yourself while he is on his peregrinations that you slyly steal the garb of his splendor as he lays it aside and blaze forthwith in your borrowed finery you are no friend to innocent goblins but a better to housebreakers you are conspirator in many direful deeds, attending base nocturnal councils, and tacitly arraigning yourself against the law. Let us be Diana's foresters, gentlemen of the shade, governed as the sea is by our noble and chaste mistress, the moon under whose countenance we steal. Was it not well said, not frankly? Your gossip is the ominous owl, and not Titania your inconstancy to come on delicate ground shineth above your other characteristics since we have seen your color come and go we surmise there is no dearth of intrigue and repartee up there and being moreover well acquainted with the texture of your red and your gray veil we infer that you masquerade periodically at very unseasonable hours of painting your complexion we are disposed to acquit you yet it is a severe blow to us to learn from the most trustworthy sources that you wax selene artemis you are worldly beyond worldlings we hear that you have quarters and that you jingle them triumphantly in the ears of orion who is nobody but a poor hunter beware of the exasperation of the lower classes whose awakening is what we call below a french revolution who indeed that hath a moat in his eye cannot still discern a huge beam in yours you are in grievous need of a resident missionary considering that you persist in obstinate schisms 
and flaunt that exploited orientalism the crescent in the face and eyes of christendom you are much more distant and reserved o beguiler than you pretend your temper is said to be volcanic you that were diana who is this falstaffian toby belchian criss kringlish person we see about your premises he hangeth his great ruddy comfortable fizz out of your casements and holdeth it sideways with a wink or a leer we look on him as an officious rascal he peereth where you only by privilege have permission to enter he hath the evil eye he thinketh himself a proper substitute for you and king of the illuminary he reproduceth your smile and scattereth your largesses he maketh faces we say it shudderingly at your worshippers below frequently hath he appropriated kisses that were blown to you personally or consigned to you for delivery from one sweetheart to another o lady o light dispenser think we hereby beseech you of the danger of his being taken for you picture the discomfiture of your minstrel who intoning a rapturous recital of your charms and casting about for a sight of your delectable loveliness is confronted instead with that broad ingenuous vagabond in some such despairing rage as the minstrels must have been the inventor of the german tongue who discarded all other chances of observation after once beholding this thing eclept your man and angrily insisted on de monde the moon as the proper mode of speech get you straightway a more acceptable minion one of more chivalric habit of more spare and ascetic exterior your credit and our comfort demand it pray you remember lest know we of your interminable starry neighbours is mars civil or heavy saturn capable of laughter hath a comet vexed you that tireless incendiary doth leo roar too loudly on your sensitive ear we fancy that the dipper is replenished frequently in your ladyship's court that the milky way is pleasantest of your pastures that the scorpion guardeth your palace gateway and that aquarius be he not delinquent tendeth your flower beds what scenes cosmopolite circumnavigator universalist have you beheld what joy what plenty what riot and desolation you are the arch spectator death sees not half so widely he lurketh like an anxious thief in the crowd seeking what he may take away but your bland leisurely eye looketh down impartially on all caravans rested a thousand years ago beneath you in the desert assyrian shepherds chanted to you with their long hushed voices the euphrates while the infant world fell into its first slumber leaped up and played with you in paradise you have known the chaos before man and yet we saw you laugh upon last april's rain are there none for whom you are lonely through the ages are there not centuries of old delight in your memory unequalled now faces fairer than the lilies on whose repose you still yearn to shine do you miss the smoke of altars have you forgotten the beginners of the starry pointing pyramid can you not tell us a tale of the visigoth how sang blundell against the prison door how brawny was bajazet how fair was helen semiramis how cruel moon where be the treasures of the doughty kid where too is the slow mysterious evening of our childhood or its dawn anticipating change as you turned away or rather where is the child that enjoyed them by your kindly ray retaining now all of which was its identity only the dense sleep the illimitable dreams of those intervening nights do you call to mind you that saw them often its after-supper frolics its halloween captures despite tub and candle its inopportune studies stolen out of mere greediness to know a fever long subsided you were kind to that something of yesterday dead as a menifus now gleam in some recess of the south to-night on bright-eyed f who answered its young jests and journeyed with it over the icy river arm in arm and on b g austere yet gentle 
who played Brutus once to its Cassius, and rise not, rise not too soon, upon our Philippi. You have been fed, O Cynthia, upon the homage of mortal lips. You have had praises from the poets exquisite as Calibus and Myrrh. Many a time have we rehearsed before you such as we recall from the sigh of Inarborus, O sovereign mistress of true melancholy, to the hymnal, orbid maiden with white fire laden, or the noble salutation of a mirthful, mournful spirit over seas. O thou art beautiful, howe'er it be, huntress or dyad, or whatever named, and he the various pagan that first framed his silver idol, and ne'er worshipped thee. Drummond, Sidney, Milton, glorified your wanderings, and your truest votary, one John Keats, spake out boldly, that the oldest shade midst oldest trees feels palpitations when thou lookest in. You are an incorrigible charmer, but as you are likewise a relief to the poor, patient oyster where he sleeps within his pearly house. We infer with pleasurable surprise that you are something better, a humanitarian. Now we venture to assert that you remember compliments meant to be of this same Orphic strain, and ascribed to you of which we are not wholly guiltless. We have all but knelt to you. The primeval heathen has stirred within us, we have been under the witchery of Isis. We aspire to be a moonshi, rather than any potentate of this universe. We wound you not with the analytic eye, nor startle you with telescopes. The skepticisms of astronomy enter not into our rubric. Are you not comely? Do you not spiritualize the darkness with one touch of your pale garment? Then what are they to us? your dimensions and your distances, gross vanity of knowledge, abuse of earthly privileges. If we affect the abusive, shy of more ceremonious forms of address, forgive us, Luna. We make recantation and disown our banter. We extend a hand of cordiality even to your man. How blithe and beauteous he is! He is embodied gentility. We bow to him as your anointed viceroy, your illustrious nuncio. You know our immemorial loyalty, nor shall our rogueries teach you so late to doubt it. Forgive us, benignant, peaceful, affable, propitious moon. Poet are we not, nor lunatic, nor lover, but that we love thee best, O oh, most best, believe it. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of Goose Quill Papers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adrian Stevens. Goose Quill Papers by Louise Imogen Guini. Brentford Pulpit. From a little church of some celebrity, and from a remote corner in its quiet nave, come these rude bygone impressions transcribed faithfully, save in whatsoever is mainly personal and local. No word is here of Brentford choir or Brentford pews, but a record, strict and spare, of the now-vanished figures who expounded texts to the village folk. For the most part they were but birds of passage, seldom remaining long enough to lose the gloss of novelty, or to escape the awakened scrutiny of young eyes. Two only of these preachers were widely known, but each of them, on the other hand, possessed a striking individuality. The King of Brentford, as readers of a certain swinging translation of Beranger will remember, was something of an anomaly, and Brentford chaplains, at least in their public career, were indubitably of his court. First we shall not recall the Reverend L, with his soft majesty of speech, having in it an ever-recurring sforzando, peculiarly impressive and overpowering, L, with his benignity of soul and his keen evanescent smile, intellect flashing through it like lightning over a sombre waste of waters, he required the closest attention of any speaker to whom we have listened. 
the following must be incessant, the allegiance unabated, lest the Emersonian and Gossamer-like sequence of ideas, the swift beauty of phrase and figure, elude you, never to reappear the same. His playfulness in the pulpit was unique. Subdued it was, yet how potent. Humour has many a fit abiding place in this world, of which the pulpit seems the last to be chosen. But L's discretion was royally sure. His salutary wit, felicitous in placing itself, and infrequent enough to rouse attention, always newly, went on angelic errands with its puck's wings. An apostolic purpose consecrated his airy thrusts at evil. The hand of steel was present ever under his caressing touches. We surmise that if there was anything connected with his vocation which L abhorred, it was the necessity of periodical charity sermons. When induced to appear as pleader on these occasions, his conduct was amusingly characteristic. He played hide-and-seek with his petition. He put it off, eyed it curiously, fenced with it, and kept it at arm's length. Then, beginning to advocate its claims, he held it up for your inspection reluctantly, as if it were no child of his, and his right were rather to befriend it in private than thrust it into public notice. He would say a few glowing words, making his fortitude under such an emergency as truly a hint to your benevolence as his spoken plea. He would sum up for you the misery of the poor, the lamentable differences in comfort, the evils that spring from unalleviated poverty, the precept of brotherly love, the imperative command of giving and sharing and making glad, and all this with an air of indifference over facts in array, and of needless appealing to such hearts and such purses as yours were sure to be. El could have written noble charity sermons for another's delivery, but to ask in his own person was well-nigh impossible. He seemed to rebel, not against the actual discomfort of his position, but rather against the advisability of reminding you of a duty you never could have forgotten. In his chivalrous dealing, he smote your sensibilities more surely than many a professional beggar with seven small children, and the shekels leaped in a fountain from you and from everybody else until the arms box overflowed. L's utility in this strange office was quite wonderful, even to himself. His very exordium, Dear old friends, was, although he knew it not, irresistible. On the morrow, workhouse Tommy with a new cap, or barefooted Molly in the exhilaration of a sturdy dinner, must have blessed the shy and half-resentful claim which a great heart put forth as theirs. L's preaching, for the most part, whether in its bright or solemn phrases, was best understood by those who best knew the man. Like Walter Savage Landor, in whom he delighted, and whom he strongly resembled, he required appreciators as well as hearers. He loved a thoughtful audience, and to such spoke with all the outpouring of his mightier self. There were minds of a certain caste, wholly foreign to his sympathies, which were slow to be persuaded into a belief of his accessibility. Yet a meeker and kinder heart than L's never beat. Half the country knew him as a fine theologian, and scarce fifty for the sweet sociable spirit that he was. A touch of the intolerance of genius he had, indeed, without which the symmetry of his character would have been impaired. D with his active and high-strung temperament, was your true conversational preacher, treating with glad and reverent familiarity thoughts beyond the reaches of our souls. Beneath the sounding board, he was perpetually on the defensive. He was always setting you straight, putting you in the way of seeing good, reconciling you to your antipathies. If we may use the word to signify a process so gentle, he hammered his optimism into you. You must be cheerful, you must be thankful, you must be self-sacrificing. There was no escaping it. D, in his zeal and his amiability, was a faraway echo of John the Evangelist, and the phrase, My little children, came with peculiar unction from his lips. His voice was not powerful. It may have been a slight hesitation and reluctance of speech which gave it an especial charm. Somewhat he lisped, also like Chaucer's friar, if not, quote, for his wantonness, to make his English sweet upon his tongue, unquote. 
We remember that once, by some chance development of his favourite topic, he came across a wayside tramp and gave him an apotheosis laughingly called to mind whenever one of that thenceforth respected species lights upon our path. Here is a vagabond, an outcast of society, began Reverend D., with his usual high-bred gesture of expostulation, a good-for-nothing beggar whom you brush as you pass, and drawing aside, mayhap in your heart of hearts you despise him, yet you have no right to despise him, nothing has destroyed or will destroy the eternal brotherhood between you. Despise him? Why, it is a disloyalty to mankind. In the eye of heaven, sinlessness is the criterion, not riches or health or intelligence, and he may stand nearer to the throne than you, because of a more repentant spirit. Why should you despise him? It belongs to you rather to love and aid him. He is a reflection of yourselves, distanced from you by the mean formalities of the world, but fashioned like you without and within, and co-heir of whatever has fallen to your share. What you have been taught through the dignity of manhood and womanhood to think yourselves, that is he. He is the image of uncreated beauty. He is the wedding guest in the palace of the king. He is the mortal who shall put on immortality. He is the son of the house of David, the hope and joy of Israel. His head is like Carmel, and his form as of Libanus, excellent as the cedars. Dare you despise him? Even as you deal with him in your thought, should the Most High deal with you in our great day forthcoming. This extraordinary burst was delivered with indescribable serenity. We have but suggested the gorgeous language in which D. revelled when he chose, nor hinted at the peculiarity of pose and intonation which helped to make his words vital. To one hearer, at least, the effect was superb, and the tramp was established in his native dignity forever. Dr. R. had the artistic temperament, being a poet of rare worth, there was always a fine metaphoric haze about his sermons. He was by nature diffident and somewhat listless. The effort of mounting the pulpit stair must have been distasteful to him. His phraser was of extreme nicety and justice. He spoke English pure and simple, yet his Greek languor, his low, unobtrusive voice, served to veil the excellence of his thoughts. He was shy of any display, his Sunday efforts certainly did not become popular in the Brentford acceptance of that term, but while R, like the clouds, seemed grey always to heedless eyes, to brighter perceptions he must have shown the delicate, transitory tints of the rainbow. He had two great merits. His quotations, scriptural and other, were exquisitely apt. He likewise knew the value of sudden epilogues. You had not time to suspect that the last rounded period was having its dying fall, before, quote, he straight disburthened bounded off as fleet as ever any arrow from a cord, End quote. Altogether another type of Levite was the Reverend M. of clear Puritan descent. He had an expansive personality, and could rise to any occasion, clothing what he had to say in easy and elegant language. As a rule, his sermons, not to speak it profanely, were pacifying as an opiate, but sometimes he stood before his astonished hearers not wholly as a symbol of the peacemaker. For his text many years back, he once took the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, Matthew 24. The awful sublimity of his reading prepared his auditors for what was to follow. Hearts were stirred to the depths that day, with the measured musical utterance, the dread and calm authority, such as fancy had conceived proper to the recording angel. M. never seemed quite so aerial and boyish in his proper person again. That one grand sermon shed its supernatural light still over him as he walked on Monday and Tuesday in view of the laity. It seemed as if all his previous and subsequent words and ways were a disguise, and that only on the never-to-be-forgotten morning he had been revealed. None of his other attempts were thereafter held in comparison with this, an advantage not to be doubted. A magnificent prejudice in his favour would fain have forced upon his every parley the beauty which the first had worn. We last heard the Reverend M., he was then nearing his sixtieth year. 
on the evening of a Christmas day, we recall that he began by poetically picturing the corresponding hour of that primal Christmas when the divine child lay slumbering in his mother's arms, the hush of the Bethlehem hills, the unconsciousness of the broad kingdom that knew him not. Little by little, the monotones of this tranquil discourse fell, like so many snowflakes upon our eyelids, a swinging festoon of smilax, stirred by chance beneath the pulpit edge, charmed us deeper into oblivion. The light ran in eddies on the faint grey walls. The visible, the palpable, were as if they had not been. We had slipped from our moorings into the irresistible depth of dreams. Presently we heard anew, half distinctly, half confusedly, O oh, expectato gentium! We looked towards the starting point of that Latin spray, but nothing followed upon our sudden rousing save the burst of the organ. All about us was a rustling and a stirring, such as the Ephesian sleepers might make at the awakening. Horrible dreams were over for many others, beside the solitary culprit we had supposed ourselves. Bonnets nodded, furs were smoothed, numbed feet were tapped upon the carpet for resuscitation, and Chubbuck, in the next pew rubbed his eyes to the imminent extinction of those useful auxiliaries. Heaven forgive us our drowsiness! How much aesthetic pleasure, how much spiritual profit Brentford missed that night, befits us not to conjecture. Yet we palliate the disgraceful circumstances, due in no wise to lack of virtue on our part, or of eloquence on the Reverend M's, by surmising that the general slumber was a tribute of itself not indeed a protest of weariness or ungracious abstraction from duty, but rather an affiliation with the time and the theme, quote, made all of sweet accord, unquote. What shall I gainsay it? The like hap, we are sorry to state, never befell us under the spell of that austere prelate, Theophilus A. One could have soon have grown mindless of a gatling gun in full activity. He was an ecclesiastical thunderbolt, Ferdinand would have put him on the Inquisition. He could have served the medieval writs of excommunication on kings, or stood with high-hearted Hildebrand to confront the German at Canossa. A was pale, but not weakly, with his dauntless eye, his luminous front, his unrelaxed lips drawn like a bowstring. He was all vehemence, his dearly beloved had scintillations to them, his very first Liz and second Liz had the heroic ring. Did we wear the armour of the ancestral Franks under his clerical dress? Whence got he that tremendous vigour, that aptitude for great and hazardous things? Apollyon could scarcely have lessened the vitality of this Christian by any combat, however long and fierce. You must have felt his presence helpful or harsh as your organisation prompted. A harp will quiver, with a concussion in its vicinity, so with mortal men and women in juxtaposition with the Reverend A. He had aroused splendid impulses, so it was said, in many lands, but the ultra-sensitive soul was scarcely adapted to his touch. He it was who could make Willard, serene as a child, shake like an aspen leaf at his mildest peroration. More comfortably enchanting wert thou, O K, whom every tongue praised, welcome was thy young cherubic countenance, dawning midway between the roof and the aisles. Worthy of Talma was that shining dramatic gift which brightened a hundredfold the utterances of thy manly piety. Who could make doubtful issues surer than thou, least didactic, yet most practical of preachers? Who could so boldly pursue a simile, eking analogies out of stones? Who so pitiless on impostures and shams, when thy gallant oratory, quote, blew them transverse, ten thousand leagues awry? Unquote. Peter the Hermit, with his crusading spirit, would have loved thee. It was the fashion at one time to classify K, along with Dr. S, of a neighbouring city, a gentleman with whom he had a few mental traits in common, outside the gift of eloquence. S was the inimitable to his parishioners, and he had, like Bobadil, most un, in one breath, utterable skill, sir. The matter of his sermons could have been turned without alteration into blank verse, having cadences manifold. He spoke rapidly, 
and moved alternately from side to side in lieu of gesticulation. He studied no opportunity, but lavished his fine things like an almoner at a coronation, here and there and everywhere. Kay, never a user of notes, and no less spontaneous than his famous reputed rival, was habitually careful of detail. His imagination was gorgeous. His activity ran to the verge of restlessness. Thoroughly earnest and exhilarating, his large intelligence was cheery as a breeze from the mountain top. Neither can we forget Brentford's titanic visitor, magnificently verbose, looming at his extraordinary height, with a fund of simplicity and gentleness hidden somewhere beneath that generous exterior. How guileless he was, how tender, invaluable at a tragedy. The petition which Mr. Thomas Prince delivered in the Old South would have fallen with equal grace from N's lips. Quote, o Lord, we would not advise, but if, in thy providence, a tempest should arise, and drive the French fleet hence, and scatter it far and wide, and sink it in the sea, we should be satisfied, and thine the glory be. End quote. With what further, two parts patriotism, one part innocence, would N have pronounced that mischievous supplication? His conscientiousness carried him once a little too far, and the sequel dimmed these spectacles, as Thackeray used to say. It was to us the funniest thing that ever happened in sacred precincts, funny beyond all power of endurance. When Solomon finished the temple, said the Reverend N in his sonorous tones, when Solomon finished the temple, he sacrificed one hundred and twenty thousand sheep and twenty-two thousand oxen. Now that was incontestable, but immediately a wretched little doubt crept in upon his biblical assertion. Seventy thousand, er, uh, er, uh, twenty thousand sheep, continued the Reverend N. Twenty hundred thousand ox, ahem, I mean two hundred thousand, a hundred and twenty, er, uh, very slow and deliberate reiteration, Two and twenty thousand oxen, one hundred and twenty thousand sheep. When the last sheep came on the scene, we were suffering from agonies of laughter. Let us trust that they turned their meek and startled eyes another way. There was H, too, a white-haired logician, who had proved everything from the creation down to the principles of good and evil, in the most neglected queer small boy, E, drawing exquisite homily illustrations from the sea, and gracious little B, the polished rhetorician, most deferent in his manner of address, most scrupulously reliant on the sense and rectitude of those around him. Honour and reverence and good repute be with them all now, wheresoever they may labour or rest. We think sometimes we have heard Cyril and Polycarp among them. Our incurable tendency towards observation, the fact of our having been born in an observatory, so to speak, stands as apology for touching on the heaven-appointed mannerisms of Brentford, Polycarps and Cyrils. End of chapter 4「Gently was a middle-aged, bookish friend of ours, in no way remarkable, save that he unconsciously nullified Emerson's smiling prediction, and wore off a pencil point in writing down the disconcerted fancies of a few days. Poor T.G. has long since been gathered to his father's. In justice to the pencil, we transcribe some of his memoranda. No pleasure or success in life quite meets the capacity of our hearts. We take in our good things with enthusiasm and think ourselves happy and satisfied, but afterward, when the froth and foam have subsided, we discover that the goblet is not more than half filled with the golden liquid that was poured into it. 
Reciprocity of goodwill and not compatibility of tastes is the first requisite of friendship. How singularly fresh and sweet is Mozart's music, like the cadence of waters over a rocky bed or the bird chorus of a May morning, his melodies and those of nature have always some subtle association. It is as if we knew the noble mother and walked often by her side, and some fine day we meet the intelligent and sportive child, finding in his voice, his gestures, his salutation, something foreshadowed to us in that other and beautiful in both. Life is a breathing space between two eternities, a holiday with appalling realities behind and before. Barbarians speak with naked hearts together. We have polite conversation. I am fond of smelling the spring, detecting growth before it shows itself by the delicious, damp odour in the fields. Snow and rain have their separate fragrance, I know at a distance the aromatic pine, the eatable whiff of birch bark, the oily sweetness of sappy maples, the tart goodness of a sorrel patch, and the scent of crushed tansy. The Chinese countenance is impassive, as if the old, old weight of Asiatic civilization had blunted and oppressed it. Van Dyck deified his sitters. He is like the sun in Shakespeare's line, gilding pale streams with heavenly alchemy. A good dinner is not to be despised. It paves the way for all the virtues. B knew a little French girl who always insisted, with a pretty extravagance of intonation, that pigs in their grunt were saying, Nous aurons congé. When a soul finds nothing to reverence among its common surroundings, it is blind indeed. The beauty of youth is inconstant and shifting as the tint at the heart of a rose, not two mornings the same, or the fall of snowflakes, blown by every wind into new and airy relationships. The brook farmer is extinct now as the dodo, it would be a delight to come across one who is sensitive yet on the subject of that Arcadian failure. When genius seems to work disregarding rule, we may be sure that it has assimilated to itself whatever is best in every rule. The undertaker ostensibly reverses the venerable truism that the young may die and the old must by thrusting forward the smaller coffins in his awful windows and keeping the others, in the subjunctive mood, as it were, well in the background. The mind is fearless, so long as there is no reproach of conscience. When that comes, come breakage and bondage in a host of terrors. Shelley was all fire and air. His eye had perpetually the fixed light of a daydreamer's. There is a marked resemblance between the portrait of him taken at Rome in 1819 by Miss Curran and that of Sir Philip Sidney engraved from the original and prefixed to Grossart's edition, a resemblance not astonishing save to those unacquainted with both mild and heroic spirits. It seems a little difficult to discern clearly the happiness or misery of those very near to us in a fiction. Souls have their perspective and need to be removed from the eye, that it may scan them justly. Sickness is such a humiliation that some cannot survive its first infliction. We try hard to cure superstition, which has been defined as the surplus of faith, the mere foam and scum of what is valuable. Overconfidence and enthusiasm, which are in the same degree the excess of hope and love, we do not try to cure at all. Thompson, the poet, was so lazy that he used to eat peaches off the trees, standing with his hands contentedly plunged in his pockets. Would not the weather hang itself in despair if no notice were taken of it, and if every man, woman, and child forbore to speak of it for three successive days? Frostling used to signify a bough, blossom, or fruit nipped by the cold, and windling, one blown from its natural support, too sweet 
and expressive words, now obsolete and without synonyms. It is hard to account for their being left behind in the race for the development of our English. W, whose beliefs are quite fixed, vacillates nobly in matters of opinion. In a group of debaters he holds with no one long, but must needs jump at a conclusion so liberal and sure that it reconciles all hostilities. All lovers are bewitched, steeped in illusions, versed in the oracles, the riddle themselves of the whole world. Ye smiler with ye knife under ye cloak, what a picture in that line of Chaucer. The Puritan was a man of severities. He never forgot that God struck Oza and buried Pharaoh in the sea. He went through the world wearing his creed, like a sword, solely for aggressive purposes. The deficiency of gentle manners, in one not bred to their practice, can nearly always be supplied by sensibility or by tact. Quote, Take them, O great eternity, our little life is but a gust which bends the branches of thy tree and trails its blossoms through the dust. Unquote. I never knew a critic to note the metaphor in these musical lines of Longfellow, but it seems to me quite haunting and overpowering and of extraordinary beauty. When you wear your old and shabby coat, anticipating a continued storm, and the sunshine's making you out of place with your ill-chosen garb, how natural it is to trace the analogy from dress to manners, and reflect how poor a show premeditated surliness and sourness make in the broad light of the world. We die and are forgotten, but must we forget? The Greek pastoral compliment Thou singest better than a cicada, would do very well nowadays for an amiable old lady to address to her tea kettle on the hob. Thoreau greatly rejoiced in what he called his invisible suit, a sort of mottled brown and green stuff in which he could cross a field undetected. There was once a golden age, because golden hearts beat in it. If it comes again, it will scarcely be through scientific progress. What an excellent high-minded motto would the last words of Walter Raleigh make. So the heart be straight, it matters not how the head lieth. It is an echo of that celestial text, Be ye not solicitous, and implies serene disregard of all but things essential. It may be exacting, but not a whit so beyond justice, when I feel that if I serve the king, he must repay me in love and trust, or my allegiance cannot thrive. I came of late across a newly told jest of sea lambs concerning Stilton cheese, which pleased me tremendously, having the indubitable flavour of his wit and being, what is rarely the case with floating anecdotes of him, unmistakably his. I cannot recall faces or forms that I have seldom met, or recognise them again with ease, unless some revealed trait or expression of the soul has made gait, contour, and presence memorable. Pride is the distorter of souls, cheerfulness the helper, love the beautifier, sorrow the redeemer. If I ever had the heroic strain, it has receded beyond my own perception, and like an athlete out of practice, I have to brace before doing that which is right, in defiance of inclination. The pure in heart shall see God, severe and lovely touchstone for mankind. I saw once two sisters, the younger resembling the other, as the translation of a poem does its original, moving by the same laws of beauty, yet inevitably lacking something of the earlier grace and flavour. 23rd May, 1881. Hawthorne buried seventeen years ago today. Who henceforth shall sing to thy pipe, O thrice lamented? Who shall set mouth to thy reeds? How very considerate of the failings of others must be that man who remembers constantly the infinite mercy he himself needs. A good temper is a jewel extraordinary, and a worker of wonders. 
One of the old chroniclers tells of an irresistibly amiable monk who for some misdemeanor was sent to hell and released again because Satan could not provoke or torment him. The sight of a hearse against the joyous streets is always depressing, a dark line drawn through thoughtless festivity like the dread writing on the wall at Belshazzar's feast. C's poetry has much simplicity, calmness, pastoral sense and beauty. His prose is jerky and barbaric. He is a sort of medal having the king's head finished on one side, the rough, uncouth surface wanting a stamp on the other. An odd and good resolve to carry the right hand always ungloved, lest one should meet a friend and be off one's cordiality, so to speak, or a foe and be off one's self-defence. Reserve is made sometimes of chain mail, sometimes of solid plate steel. One is as good armour as the other, though not so obvious. Some people wear out everything quickly and naturally, clothes, acquaintanceship, books, pleasures, even dear life itself. I am delighted at Lowell's saying that our modern terms the deuce and old scratch were evidently derived from dus and scrat, hairy wood demons amongst the Celts and Teutons. The best of everything is the only individual of that thing. We should ignore the rest. I think one of the drollest stories I ever heard of absent-mindedness is this of old P, the barrister. He and his friend M were sitting close together about the hearth of a winter night. There was no light. They were alone and silent. Suddenly P got thinking of some project, and according to his villainous and immemorial habit, meditatively began to scratch his cranium. He came to a pause, but recovering the sequence of his thoughts, felt compelled likewise to resume the physical operation. But this time P wildly clutched not his own, but M's profuser locks, and furiously recommenced. M stood it for a moment, inwardly convulsed with laughter, then lightly removed the offending hand, and P roared out angrily, faltering in the middle of his speech with a bewilderment beautiful to see. Great George! Don't you suppose I have a right, a right to, to... You don't mean to say that wasn't my own head? Standing is the most royal and natural pose. I have a sympathy for that Roman emperor who sprang to his feet to meet the quick death that came upon him. Spencer, the noblest mind the best contentment has. Thoreau, by way of exemplification, I shall not fret to be a giant, but be the biggest pygmy that I can. Hawthorne wrote with his conscience. It was a sort of celestial coloured ink which he kept by him, and into which ever and anon he dipped his pen. I was struck anew, of late, with the complete ideality of the Venus of Melos, its charm of detail, out-naturing nature, the head so delicately moulded, the neck so slender yet so strong, the scarce deviating outline from shoulder to hip, the very apotheosis of health and beauty, with a spirituality over all that sets you thinking of a sweet and ample heart within. There is scarcely a blow in after-life comparable to that first sad intimation, perhaps in early youth, that human nature is not what we thought it, not the thing of our dreams, little else than a tissue of frailties woven together. Shakespeare's Rosalind is not very dissimilar to the best type of that much maligned American girl. She is full of frolic parley, self-reliant, tender, womanly. Old hushed Egypt put down that golden phrase along with many another to Lee Hunt when a delightsome author threatens to be forgotten, credit him at least with what he has added to the soul of literature and let him be buried with all his travelling glories round him. The French language is eau sucre. 
the German, a cup or thy small beer, sweet hostess. If I have a friend, though absent many years, I hold a true treasure with fear and trembling, knowing that whatever losses come, I have been blessed beyond measure with the wealth no chance can take away. Love is unlike the bow of Ulysses, in that it can be drawn to its full capacity of magnificence or destruction not only by the greatest. I know a man who looks like Boccaccio and does not appreciate it. Genius, like the lowly insect having prophetic stirrings of the beauty it is to evolve, needs solitude and must build it unaided for itself, if it come forth in due time winged and lovely to the sun, or if it die in the dark unsuspected of its aim, either end will be found best relatively to the life it affects. There is no participator who serves so well in any conversation as an adept in commonplaces and words, words, words. Milton's charm of half-awakened birds means charm in the pretty old English sense of twittering, piping softly and confusedly. Much of Thomas Hood's more serious work is overlooked by the public eye. Someone will be obliged to come forth by and by to say, and to say truly, that nobler poems than The Haunted House, The Poet's Portion, and Death were never written. In the matter of reform, I should choose often to be a crab reformer and to move backward after many wish-worthy things of yesterday. Thackeray says somewhere that we see the world, each of us, with our own sight, and make from within us the world we see. By way of experiment, a youngling of scholarly race might be kept wholly from books, etc., to see if the ancestral learning would not revive of itself. It pains me to see coarseness predominant in the human countenance, a thing so ethereal and divine of itself. Think of the forerunning wrongs back in the generations which have prompted and helped it to its present degradation. The poets, in chronicling strong emotion over things actual or imagined, must frequently outgo the force of the emotion in the expression of it, so that they have the power of draining off the whole supply and depth of their feeling. Coleridge should have lived in the times of the oracles. He would have drawn, as we say, better than Delphi. At the funeral of a celebrated artist, wherein I took no part whatsoever, and had only a genuine sorrow for the public loss to excuse my slipping into the church, the sexton wanted to seat me conspicuously, taking me for a chief mourner, for a relative at least, he said. I was pleased at the limiting clause. Children are born optimists, and we slowly educate them out of their heresy. We are stricken mute by an heroic death. Praise is poor and vain if the life forerunning it was heroic too, and if it was not, love and forgiveness seem not hard good enough to offer at the ruined shrine where at last a divinity has descended. In sensitive natures, just as the ordinary, blessings of life cast an aggrandized shadow and result in supreme pleasure, so their denial becomes a matter of deep pain, equally disproportionate to the cause. It is better to fall into added disrepute with an enemy than to alienate a would-be friend. Frankness prevents troubles that only time can cure. A good and worthy life cannot be detached or wholly useless because unfinished. When you throw a number of broken rings on the floor, on lifting one, you find it casually joined with another, and each in turn with many more. So must a man's endeavour to cooperate with the predecessors and be linked again with some life-work to be ended tomorrow, in beautiful, enduring sequence. Though to outward vision, all three were but severally a fragment and a failure. End of chapter 5
Chapter 6 of Goose Quill Papers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adrian Stevens. Goose Quill Papers by Louise Imogen Guini. On Teaching One's Grandmother How to Suck Eggs. In the days of the schoolmen, when no vexed question went without its fair showing, it seems incredible that the proposition here to affixed as a title provoked no labyrinthine reasoning from any of those musty and hair-splitting philosophers. Aristotle himself overlooked it, Dun Scotus, and the noted Aurelius Philip Frastiferus Bombast Honemheim Paracelsus, were content to repeat his sin of omission. Even that seventeenth century English essayist and scholar, whose understanding was wide as the terrene firmament, neither unearthed the origin of this singular implied practice, nor attempted in any way to uphold or deprecate it. The phrase hath scarce the grace of an oriental precept, and scarce the dignity of Rome. It might sooner appertain to Sparta, where the old were held in reverence, and where their education, in a burst of filial anxiety, may be prolonged beyond the usual term of mental receptivity. It is reserved, therefore, for some modern inquirer to fix it, for certain, whether the strange accomplishment in mind was at any time in any nation barbarous or enlightened in universal repute among venerable females, or else especially imparted under the rose as a sort of witch-trick to conjurers, fortune-tellers, pythonesses, sibyls, and such secretive and oracular folk whether the initiatory lessons were theoretical merely, and at what age the grandams, for the condition of hyper-maternity was at least imperative, were allowed to matriculate themselves in the precincts of this lost art. It is a partial argument against the antiquity of the custom and against the supposition of its having prevailed among old Europe's nomadic tribes that several of these are accused by historians of having destroyed their progenitors, whereas it is reasonably to be inferred that the gentle process of obvious adjacence had such then been invented would have kept the savage fireside peopled with happy and industrious centenarians. After the arduous labour of their long lives, this new leisurely, immeasurably mild and genteel trade could be acquired with imperceptible trouble. Cato, mastering Greek at eighty, Dandello, leading hosts when past his nonage, are kittenish, and irreverent figures, beside that of a toothless goth grandmother learning, with melancholy energy, to suck eggs. We know not why the privilege of education, if granted to them without question, should have been withheld from their grey spouses, who certainly would have preferred so sociable an industry to whetting the knives of the hunters or tending watchfires by night. But no one of us ever heard of a grandfather sucking eggs. The gentle art was apparently sacred to the gentle sex, and withheld from the shaggy lords of creation until the fierce creatures, ignorant of the innutritive properties of the shell, took to devouring them whole. By what means was the race of hens, for instance, preserved? Statistics might be proffered concerning the antenatal consumption of fledglings, which would edify students of natural history, one bitterly disputed point the noble adage under consideration permanently settles a quibble which ought to have quote, staggered the stout statuite, unquote, and which has come even to the notice of grave inductive theologians, videlicet, 
that the bird and not the egg may claim the priority of existence for had it been otherwise one's grandmother would have been early acquainted with the very article which her posterity recommended to her as a novelty and which with respect for care they taught her to utilize after a fashion best adapted to her time of life fallen into desuetude is this judicious and salutary custom there must have been a time when a yellowish stain about the mouth denoted an age a vocation a limitation effectually has the buller of the youth the maiden's girdle the marshal's truncheon or the judge's robe or any of the picturesque distinctions now crushed out of the social code let a cynic add who does not fear to chase a trope beyond bounds that though certain misguided ancient ladies may lapse contemporaneously into the burlesque and parody of suction and draw towards themselves some yet coveted fooleries compliments gallantries alas acronisms both yet the orthodox sucking of eggs the innocent austere philosophic pastime is no more and that the glory of grandams is extinguished for ever the dreadful civility of our western woodsmen the popular dissentient voice alike of the theatre and of the political meeting the casting of eggs wherefrom the elements of youth and eucundity are wholly eliminated affords a speculation on heredity and appears as a faint echo of some traditional squabble in the morning of the world among disagreeing kingsmen the very primordial battle of x where reloading was superfluous where every shell told whose blackest spite was spent in a golden rain and hail what havoc over the face of young creation what colouring of pools and of errant butterflies what distress amid the cleanly pixies and dryads whose shady haunts trickled unwelcome moisture terror not unshared even in the recesses of the coast quote, intus aquae dulcis vilvoque sedilia saxo nefarium dormus Unquote. one can fancy the younglings of the vast human family the successes of whose lesson to the elders was thus over well demonstrated marking the ebb and flow of hostilities like the spirits of richelieu and of the superb fourteenth louis eyeing the great revolution what marvel if struck with remorse at the senile strife of them whom old fuller would name she citizens they vowed never never to teach another grandmother to suck eggs so was it maybe that the abused art was lost from the earth nay more its remembrance is perverted into a taunt more scorching than lightning more silencing than the bolt of jove teach your grandmother to suck eggs is not the phrase the scorn of scorn the catchword of insubordination the blazing defiance of tongues unbroken as a two years cult it grated strangely on our ear we grieved over the transformation of a favourite saw innocuous once and conveying a meek educational suggestion we came to admit that the academe where the old sat at the feet of their descendants to be ingratiated into the most amiable of professions was nothing better in memory than an impertinence 
and we sadly avowed in the underground chamber of our private heart that as for worldly prospects it would be fairly suicidal all things considered to aspire to the chair of that professorship let some reformer who cherishes his ancestress and who is not averse to break his fast on an omelette dissuade either object of his regard from longer lending name and countenance to a vulgar sneer shall such be thy mission reader we would wish the extended acquaintance with that mysterious small cosmos which suggests to the liberal palate broiled wing and giblets in posse the joy for many a year of thy parent's parent who is in some sort thy reference and means of identification the hub of thy far-reaching and more active life but prithee wrench apart from their sorry association in our english speech purists shall forgive thee if thou shalt meanwhile smile in thy sleeve at the fantastic text which brought them together end of chapter six chapter seven of goose quill papers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adrian Stevens. Goosequill Papers by Louise Imogen Guini. Old Haunts. I sometimes whimsically liken myself to that pursued bird who, according to naturalists, spends her fine speed and strength in racing in a circle about her nest, until overtaken and overborne. She may be said to travel a great deal, yet her steps tend nowhere and despite her coming and going, she is indubitably at home. I betake me, with all the exhilaration of a tourist, into an adjacent county, and after experiencing the forlornness proper to a forty years' exile, board the railway train, and throw myself into the arms of my native town. My wildest perambulations are but twenty miles away. I set out with vehement desires to behold the world, and threading the narrow highways known of mine infancy, quote, downwards to the sea or landwards to the west, unquote, return to look the stoutest navigators and explorers in the eye. My change of scene is mainly from Bromfield Street, what a green and golden westerly prospect it has, to the ridge path of the common. My perilous adventures are on sidewalks, my discoveries in omnibuses, and the windows of shops. Through sheer liberality and open-mindedness, when the first stirrings of spring are in the blood, or when a hearty October morning tempts idle feet afar, myself and one other seize on a map of the adjacent country, and push over hill and dale into some unexplored solitude. We make heroic efforts to appreciate a landscape, was it not yesterday, thou best Bostonian, that we accomplished our showy pilgrimage across the Middlesex fells, now drenched, now dried by fickle skies, to sniff the young violet, and to pluck the sylvan willow tufts ere they had paled, or marched nigh six leagues of an Arcadian afternoon to front the gleaming waters at Ponkapog, the purple crests of Milton Hill? Vainly, never saw we a Nereid along a pebbly margin, nor caught the cadence of a hamadryad's footfall as she hurried back to her old woods. The curse is upon us, as saith the problematical Lady of Shalott. What business have we in the country? Where is the plant that will teach us its name? Not green fields, but bricks and mortar are our affinity, and the ears that delight in the familiar roar of a crowd barely attend by courtesy to the madrigals of thrushes. Rivers I can put up with. I can keep pace with Charles from Hopkinton to the sea. Neponset is a good deer prattler. Musketaquid, with his two exquisite parental streams, is mine old familiar. 
so with a pine grove, where one can watch the tardiest star arise and the earliest daybeam break over its dark summits. But these everlasting downs and scrubby wildernesses, these formal vacant pastures with little white houses at chilling distances, it is not in me, by nature or by grace, to take kindly to the things. The spirit moveth me to look down on cows, hens and cabbages, and to question the beauty of that manner of life where there is scarce a ratio of one fellow creature to an acre. How shall your country folk learn to jostle and be jostled? Do they know a pickpocket when they see him? Are they easy in their minds when the street bands are due? Have their unhappy progeny never spilled out of Circus Bill's gorgeous chancery of blue and red, nor leaped into the jaws of a watering cart, nor licked a lamp post for a wager on a frosty night? No, my masters, let Damitus and Daphnis sing at each other over the heads of their woolly cohorts. I yearn for the whoop of the contemporaneous newsboy, and for the soul-satisfying thunder of wagons. I hasten back to the knee of mine illustrious mother city, as a peri to paradise, or as a convict, we must have comparisons to suit all tastes, to that agreeable castle in which the state formerly entertained him. I am let loose anew on her historic thoroughfares. For her sake I subsist, in no gastronomical sense, on dates, and pay court to hoary tombs and spectres of long-supplanted buildings. Her story is the kaleidoscope to charm my idle hours. Her ancient magistrates I behold in their pretentious wigs. Her little maids rustle by in stomacher and kirtle, Jovial laughter floats out from the unlatched door of the green dragon. The aroma of venison betrays itself at the Cromwell's head. I look upon sorrowful Quakers boarding the transportation ships, or at the beacon light flaring out upon the bay, at Paddock planting his memorial trees, at May the Biles jesting among a crowd under the province house eaves, at Philemon Pormort shaking the birch a little, Ben Franklin on the sunny side of School Street, at the chivalry of France, riding twenty deep behind the drawn sword in thy gallant hand, Vio Manuel. Over all the shifting and confused panorama, the great bells of Christ's, Abel Rudhall cast them all, are ringing the remembered chimes of home. The things to be seen and observed, said Bacon, are the courts of princes, the courts of justice, consistories, ecclesiastic, churches, monasteries, monuments, walls and fortifications, havens, harbours, antiquities, ruins, libraries, colleges, shipping, gardens, arsenals, burses. Rather than sigh for cisalpine revelations, shall I not gloriously disport myself in following the fortunes of a local Punch and Judy show, such as our kind civic nurse hath provided for us? Perhaps elsewhere I should miss the white-bearded orange vendor dozing in the sun, and the sparrows fighting on the sombre steps of St. Paul's, and seedy students migrating from stack to stack of Elizabethan books in the tranquil lane that Uriah Cotting built. Dearer than coffers of gold are the old cherished places from which my rooted affections cannot stray, their inviolate memories and their hopes are mine, and the city of my content is the loophole through which I gaze and wonder at the universe. I wear out my restlessness, circling round about her shining height, and breaking ever and anon momentarily from her fostering hand, to cling to it again with laughter, and so move on. Is it a braver sentiment to fret after reported continents? I would follow the moon around the untried earth for the asking, and yet, and yet, O oh, three-hilled rebel town, hate my own free spirit, did it not thirst for thee on a ship that sailed against the golden horn, between Caucasus and the pinnacles of Greece? End of chapter 7「Chapter 8 of Goose Quill Papers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Goose Quill Papers by Louise Imogen Guiney. Three Thoughts on Books. The passion for collecting books, beginning with the Greeks, passed to the Roman senators and patriots, and thence to every corner of the civilized earth. A philosopher might sigh, like Omar at Alexandria, over the thousand thousand superfluities, whose survival embitters the thought of the lost volumes of Varro and Livy, the well-nigh inaccessible tomes of Al-Farabi or Farab, who knew or wrote so much as he, of Burney, of Matarell, or of those princely libraries instanced by Irish antiquarians which were swept away by Noah's flood. A line of shelves, throne by throne, filled with illustrious figures, what else is that but a presence chamber kinglier than a king's, the temple of wisdom, more reverend than the altars of Pallas? Men have lived and died, like motes on the air, hovering about this hoarded preciousness of ages, and forgetful ever of the awakened world with its exquisite outlook into the future. In the pathetic companionship of books lived Southey, long after their beauty was shut out from him, passing his trembling hand up and down their ranks, and taking comfort in the certainty that they had not forsaken him. Remembering a bibliopole's sincere care in gathering his treasures, the taste and tenderness he spends upon them, the actual individuality of the owner of which they partake, and which they proclaim with startling fidelity so long as they are together, an auctioneer's sale of a private library seems one of the cruelest things in the daily annals of a city. Yet if not transferred, in numbers or in the mass, to some benign shelter, the darlings of bygone hours are sure to be launched friendless on the rough chances of trade. A second-hand book is verily a pitiful thing. It is broken down by adversity, and ready to meet your advances halfway. It appreciates care of any sort, poor waif that it is. Lacking attention so long in the dingly precincts of a shop. Nothing is more gratifying to the eye searching for tokens of humanity, like a shipwrecked sailor along the sands of a lonely island, than its curled edges, but thumbed horribly, especially if the author thereof be dear to you. What a precious, homely tribute! What delicate a flattery than to catch sight of a modest volume, supposing you take some parental interest in it, in a condition which, a posteriori, does not suggest soap and water. Certain books, which we handle for the first time, we cannot for the life of us lay down again, without vehement infringements on that edict forbidding envy and covetousness. We yearn for such a bit of property. Our pocket seems predestined to filch it. We love it much better than its proprietor, who never had the spirit to give it cordial abuse. We would not endure that papal cover veiling its genial face. We would scorn to divorce it from any dusty nook it chose to frequent. If we abduct it, it would be a great deal happier. On the same principle, it requires an impulse of Spartan righteousness to return a book to the civic library with the proper dispositions. It is heartrending to make over a used and shaken veteran to the custody of the public anew. We know well enough that it shall collapse utterly ere we shall have the virtue to borrow it a second time or we speculate on an inestimable octavo, readerless on the shelf for scores of years, till our mark is set over against it, and doomed to deeper than Abyssinian solitude when we loosen its clinging hold, and wonder if what a townsman and a wit called buccaneering would not be a chivalric pursuit for us to follow. Uniform sets of any author, save a historian, are terrors to the discriminating eye. When we buy the works even of one C. Dickens, we shall stipulate that the tale of two cities, never to be named without reverence, shall get its just due of difference in size and hue from any of its admirable kindred. Who wants Beaumont and Fletcher in sombre cloth, or in anything out of folio, or Jeremy Taylor in red morocco and gilt? Prefaces are not ill things in their places, but what has a preface got to do with jolly self-explanatory peppers, or a table of notes with Walton the Angler, or a glossary, fancy the pert thing, with Philip Sidney's sonnets? Illustrations to some tales are insufferable. Picture a menagerie let loose on the seventh or eighth page of Rasselas to bear out the diverting Johnsonian description of the sprightly kid bounding on the rocks, the subtle monkey frolicking among the trees, the solemn elephant reposing in the shade. A big book, said Miles Davis, is a scarecrow to the head and pocket of author, student, buyer, and seller. That depends. The virile poets, like Burns, cannot be got into sylph-like draperies. Nobody could abide a prose Milton less than three and a half inches thick. Frossard, even, must be taken solid. We own up to loving our stumpy Don Quixote, with its print of beauteous Dorothea laving her impossible feet, although it be egregiously fat, and elbow its comelier neighbours right and left.
The fashion of including the productions of two or three contemporaneous writers in one volume is happily past, and may not revive. What dreary comradeship, like that of the ghosts driven together on the blast in Dante's wonderful fifth canto. Why should Coleridge the dreamer, and Campbell the planner, be lashed so, wrist to wrist, or Waller's sweet dallying verse classed with Denham's sagacious strophes? What joint mundane sin warranted this posthumous halving of their immortal fortunes? If the trade must economise, and readers must needs get their literature in bunches, let the coupling be done on a saner basis, and arise from the affiliations not of time or place, but of genius solely. We confess we should like to see Sheridan and Farquhar amicably sharing applause, within the compass of one lively coloured quarto. Some of the singing birds of the second and third Stuart courts caged with Gay, Matt Pryor, and a few modern bardlings. Keats close to his loved Spencer and Irving familiarly fixed by Addison and Goldsmith, the barriers of centuries between them broken down. Family traits, like murder, will out. Nature has but so many moulds, and however unique and quaint a writer may be to his own circle, look up his intellectual pedigree and you shall recognise the ancestral quality astray in him, on an altered world. The voice of Jacob, indeed, appealing through all disguises. What should Poe be like, Poe the one and only, but a blended brief echo of Marlowe and of Dryden. Whence came Charles Lamb, even in great part, and Hazlitt and Lee Hunt besides, in the collateral line, but from golden-hearted Sidney and Sir Thomas Brown? Pages and pages of his that recall them, every tone of their old sedated voices prophetic of his sweet laughter, his fine, grave reasonings to be. My young lord is spirited, but unlike his father or mother in feature, as in character, Ah, go to the remotest corner of the portrait gallery, and brush away the damp from the dark face of that Henry who fell at Crecy, and you shall read the mystery of transmission. A poet tries his morning lay to a continent's delight, and after years of joy and triumph it shall be revealed to him how the self-same music fell from long silent lips in a land across the sea. The unaltered radiance of an inspiration streams yesterday on one, tomorrow on another, as moving sunshine visits the hundred panes of a cathedral window. And that elusive thing which we name the originality of any artist resembles little else but the kaleidoscopic newness of colour thrown hourly along the aisles. So much of books wrought to the confusion of the proud. The child's early, unconscious preference for authors of his choosing urges itself upon him when he too shall write, and softly hoodwinks his imagination. Has he a sensitive pen, jealous of its rectitude, true as the magnet lured steel to what he believes to be his frank, unshared fancies? How shall that affect the immutable law? For the very blood in his veins is not all his own, and though for honour's sake he would change the erect port, the persuasive speech, the innermost personal charm which was called his, and which he finds later to have been but a legacy, yet in places where his detecting conscience cannot follow, the hereditary principle will grow to blossom, and bespeak him blamelessly, to be what the centuries have made him. It was feelingly said by one of the gentle English essayists last named, How pleasant is the thought that such lovers of books have themselves become books, and do so become ever more, beginning and ending with a secluded library shelf, planting the seed of kindly influences close to the noble shade which sheltered them in youth, and under which they slumbered many a summer's day. End of chapter 8. Recording by Julian Prattley. Chapter 9 of Goose Quill Papers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo. Goose Quill Papers by Louise Imogen Guiney. A November Festival. Here it is. The old bright day, the day fragrant of home, brought about once again by the whirligig of time. The New England snows are deep beneath the windows in the house where I was born, and iridescent icicles hang over the door. The city that is beyond is given up to joy and plenty, and all that mighty heart is lying still. I sit quite solitary among you, in a far away corner, forgetfully turning the pages of a book, and letting my thoughts take wing 
for other scenes and other years in memory there arises a succession of thanksgivings long gone into dust and ashes so different from this so careless and kind and merry that it seems like wronging them to be sad for them even at this distance then all the world was golden and our willful loving lives were jewels set in the heart of it then the air tingled and the sun was jolly as harlequin then there was a little brook in those familiar fields delicately sheathed in ice every thanksgiving morning and lending itself to a childish holiday frolic just in the nick of time and a stone squirted along its surface made the daintiest bird-like sound imaginable and died into silence so delightfully that you sent innumerable pebbles after it to see if they could sing as sweetly as the first then everybody was so considerate and tender that poor people could not want or suffer on that day if they tried then grown people were indulgent and we people docile and frisky as lambs then we used to have popcorn and ginger snaps and chestnuts and ruddy apples and turkey well we can have turkey yet on any thanksgiving a sort of in memoriam turkey eaten in foreign lands and made melancholy with recollections and vain wishes so of course it is not the same turkey at all what a hospitable social old festival it was how gentle we tried to be that not one harsh word should spoil it we were taught to make out of the severely pious thanksgiving of the puritans their dismal unpicturesque opposition christmas a day lovely and blithe and helpful beyond any in the calendar there was a great halloo going on the whole time in the cheerful rambling old house quartering an army of children merry-making in the pantry in the quarters in the porches were hungry sparrows gathered to squabble over hundreds of crumbs and in the lively fire that winked and sputtered and tossed the pans and kettles and nearly burst a laughing over the fat plum pudding as for the other lords and ladies of misrule you could not swing your arm anywhere without brushing a little boy or a little girl you heard the patter of their tireless feet the noise of their drums and doll carriages and the echo of their shrill voices upstairs and down some of them rolling about on the rugs in the sunny room where the bare elms or their battered nests rattled against the pane on windy days some strumming on the venerable piano in the hall just at the balustrade's foot and singing a little tyrolese catch that they had learned together some grouped in the shadowy and quiet library where the ceiling shone blue with its myriad stars like a real summer sky telling over how good a king king arthur was or how queer was the old man of the sea or how sad and strange were the adventures of dear Sintram, ever and ever so long ago now other children fill those neglected places and beautify the hours with associations fresh and fair as ours and year by year our memory fades from all the circle of the hills i must not forget the races and the games and ninepins on the frosty balcony the ice forts puny for lack of material in the trojan war refought in snowballs and the dinner the tablecloth was very pretty with sprays of evergreen festooning it here and there silver mugs looked particularly shiny i can see yet beyond the great steaming dishes the celery towering with its delicate green cider sparkling grapes and oranges crowding one another over the rim olives floating in colored bottles jelly clearer than crystal funny little crackers in funnier shapes and the ring of hearty faces framing the picture in near the end the majestic pudding made his appearance crowned with blue flame and blazed away so pompously for a minute that the youngest baby cried and the boys clapped their hands and the curly-haired helen 
leaned over against Bessie to get out of its way. Then came the final jingling of the water glasses, when the household drank Grandmother Draphouse health amid enthusiasm and tears and laughter and rustle of words. It was quite an order to wear your tissue paper cap, which fell out of the candy packet, whether it was quaint and odd as could be, or conventional as a beaver, when presently, with all conceivable glee, the whole twenty-six rose to their feet, the chairs and stools made volcanic noises, and the scene looked precisely like the carnival. Then a sudden hush fell, and one of the several tall gentlemen, who answered to the name of Papa, glanced at a certain child at the other end of the table. So the child dropped its bonbons, and gravely took off its gay cocked hat, and folded its brown hands, and lisped the words of the grace, while Eugene and little Georgie bobbed their innocent heads in cadence at its shoulder. Everybody answered, Amen, very loud and clear, and everybody slipped forthwith through the door, like the tide, and left the sunny dining room deserted. Those thanksgivings will never return. The caps are torn now, and the heads that wore them would fit them no more. We could not meet to be happy again if we tried, because of the vacant places. The rogue who was made parson would not be present either. Which of us, outside paradise, is quite the same after so many years? Having vanished just as surely as the old friends, and the dear kindred who have died. For, in your own phrase, little folk, that was me. At least I like to think it was. Perhaps this is all a make-believe story, but if you doubt it, go and ask somebody else who is there. End of chapter 9「Chapter Ten of Goose Quill Papers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo. Goose Quill Papers by Louise Imogen Guiney. Vagabondiana. Certain words sound like caresses. Thou vagabond, must have been at some time or other a gentler appellation than our rude transition would make it. Why not? Rogue and truant have yet their playful uses. Though we translate illy such endearments of antiquity, we may read in Gascoigne, O Abraham's brats, O brood of blessed seed, the goodly and virtuous young imps of old citation we should also construe but saucily besides vagabond lendeth itself gracefully to the affectionate diminutives of alien tongues which to a philologist may be as good as an argument what can be tenderer than vagabondchen vagabondolino and a like musical play of syllables over the solid English rock. The vagabond is the modern representative of the knight errant, shorn of his romance, inasmuch as both fall neatly under the definition of a stroller, a freelance, whom the domestic law does not delure or attach to any one fireside. The immortal Don of La Mancha, revived in this age, should figure as a tramp in the police station before he had adorned public life twenty-four hours but the vagabond proper has an asiatic cousin who gets princelier treatment the ronin of chivalrous japan is a gentleman of leisure who not averse to a chance of seasonable employment roams at large settling his private differences and serving heaven unmolested according to his lights. Vagabonds are legally denominated such as wake on the night and sleep on the day and haunt customable taverns and alehouses 
and rout about, and no man wots whence they come nor whither they go. A comprehensive statement in three parts, which has, moreover, a covert whimsical reference, categorically to actors, politicians, and bank clerks. A vagabond, primarily, was merely an idle person, and if his name has come to imply variations of decorum and a questionable standing in polite circles, it is to be accounted for only on the worn adage that Satan takes personal care of undedicated energies. Our friend is vagrant as the swallow, born in the eighth climate, and framed and constellated unto all. He is the world's free man. He strays at his fancy, signboards and milestones his only ritual, and changes of weather the sole political economy of his study by which he abides. Everybody's property is in his fief. Terminus and his stakes were never set up for him. He has no particular reason for moving on the first of May, nor for passing the winter in warm quarters. When he is very wary, since he has no tent to strike, nor bed to make, he unconcernedly lays his neck on the lap of his mother. Neither landlord nor tenant is he, and never has he known a spring cleaning nor packed a trunk, nor priced a door plate. He trolls out that joyful strophe which Richard Brome wrote for his forefathers as he swings past inland villages. Come away, why do we stay? We have no debt or rent to pay, no bargains or comps to make, nor land nor lease to let her take. Or if we had, should that remore us, when all the worlds are owned before us, and where we pass and make resort, there is our kingdom and our court. He has his choice of professions. He may have a natural disposition to beg, yet, on the whole, consider it genteeler to steal. He is exempt from Adam's curse. Nobody expects him to work, save in a moment of inspiration. When he has no funds, he travels on his dignity. There is that in his eye which awes the merchant man and mesmerizes the maid at the hostile gate. The vagabond, extravagant and erring spirit, as Horatio would call him, has had his court painter, who took the portraits of several of his eccentric family in the year of Waterloo, and exposed them for sale in Covent Garden, under the title Etchings of Remarkable Beggars, Itinerant Traders, and Other Persons of Notoriety, drawn from the life in London town. There glisten perennially the seraphic upturned eyes of hot peas, there you may see the Hogatherian face in attitude of the one-armed vendor, of gasping, live haddock, the pastoral cousin offering young toy lambs, the dealer in pickled cucumbers, his arms akimbo, a fork stuck in the dish on his head, and a serotypish wink in his well-conducted eye, the flying pie man, smirking like Malvolio, and starched and skirted like a dignitary of bluff hals, the reduced bow, sweeping crossings with his yet fastidious air, and the humble bespectacled painter, his own drayman, changing quarters on holy Luke's day, so festooned with torsos, cast brushes, files, easels, that he seems a perambulating studio. The vagabondistic sect is of exceedingly mutable nature. It distends, it contracts, it swears in, now a person of probity, not of wealth, now a sinner, like the rest of us, who seldom moves in good society, an odd congregation, comprising dozens that have no business among the elect, and lacking a proportionate number who stray untethered into other folds. On this showing, not only all mendicants, peddlers, street singers, pickpockets, and uneasy minds are accepted rascals, but poor queer bee, who wrote poetry, and went veiled like the great Mokana, 
distraught to know whether the aggregate stare of her fellow citizens was attributable to her renown or to her scarce hellenic beauty falls into the same category and the venerable campaigner who tacks onto her hurdy-gurdy a certificate of army membership signed by napoleon presumably to be referred to her fighting spouse deceased that wrinkled and taciturn spook of what was once french vivacity and grace faithfully grinding patent pour la serie in snow and sun within a fixed radius of boston common even she must emerge despite the music of austerlitz and jenna nothing short of a naturalized yankee vagabond there are laws yet unrepealed celeste for thy suppression prices set on the innocuous heads of minstrels and useless persons we could wish that a new plutarch should write up the patron saint of vagabonds one bampfield moore carew a devonshire celebrity born under william and mary a most conscientious well-bred person and of good parts who became a gentleman at large only under irresistible conviction and who after a series of adventures before which an arabian tale covers its head rose to be king of the gypsies and great high joss of beggars and mimics henceforward a pleasant adroit creature familiar with the wilderness of what were not yet the atlantic states reckless enough to be kindly disposed towards his fellows and successful in everything he undertook living gray as a wharf rat and supple as the devil to a consistent and edifying old age we have a sneaking kindness for him and his votaries a congenital affinity softens us towards suspicious characters we were early aware that we startled shopkeepers with our roving thumb how or whence we know not but we have come to love the indiscreet something in us which calls forth puritan vigilance and we should violently resent a change of tactics more than once a jeweller who might have made a mad wag if he had not been so choked with virtue refused to give back our repaired watch eyeing us with gruesome distress and absolutely disclaimed having beheld our cockney countenance before we enter a warehouse only to await identification as they are pleased to call it from tom dick and harry and only by force of eloquence or by literal making of faces honest ingenuous reliable unevasive faces out of use but quite as good as new and triumphantly effective do we succeed in securing the household necessities reading once of a windy day seated on the sea-wall of the charles through a chance waiting hour in cloistral privacy we were accosted across lots by a sombre policeman and mysteriously lured back to the confines of civilization whereupon the misguided creature scanning our cheerful lineaments cheerful from the pages of travels with a donkey burst into uncanny laughter and presently explained that he had been detailed to save yon despondent crank from plunging into the hungry river our career of vagabond by brevet had well nigh closed seriously sir or madam you may stand by that harbour mouth and have an inkling into the tragedies of the strollers of whom men wot not whence they come nor whither they go but to keep you on the liberal side of compassion you who are not of the faith must also be made aware that aldebaran is a gracious star to his own and that wild and noble sights are vouchsafed to the outer and inner eye of shabbiest bohemianism such as they sit in parlors never dream of end of chapter ten chapter eleven of goose quill papers this is a librivox recording 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Schempf. Goose Quill Papers by Louise Imogen Guinea. Mathematics. Radamanthus is so old by this time, and so hardened into his own way of thinking, that I suppose it is useless to wish he were of my mind. What I look upon as justice, he may, moreover, call spitefulness, or worse. But I dearly desire to sit enthroned by sticks in his stead, that I might adjudge dire reparative torments to old Euclid and to Eton, that modern figurative fiend, and to the entire tribe of evil inventing Arabs. What hope is there in this world for redress? such creatures have been lauded as friends of civilization and of human progress tens of thousands mostly helpless miners and stray rebels of all ages among whom i am but a meek adam make passionate protest we go about with an ancient school rhyme for our marseillaise multiplications of vexation subtractions just as bad the rule of three it puzzles me and fractions drive me mad we aspire to be moderate we handle a slate and pencil forgivingly we consider that history is somewhat against us for caesar believed doggedly in addition and the generals of the great alexander were fond of division all their days we try to get over our distrust of the book of numbers and to think it quite canonical vainly vainly we are still the army of the disaffected and your numeric blood which was transfused into us by main force seethes and hisses in our unproselytized veins mine antipathy to a unit like an ancestral prejudice developed in infancy i cannot reconcile myself to that persistent squandering of my capabilities and nothing shall persuade me that they were not fine primarily on insufferable jargon of twice two and thirteen times twenty-seven on angles polygons hypotenuses and roots of diabolic cubes on having and cancelling everything solomon in his wisdom had never heard of save the growing intact substantial aversion outlasting all else what glory and honour did it bring me the singular privilege of taking and giving money on faith of confusing ounces yards and quarts and of being circumvented as burton scornfully put it by every base tradesman the valet cretans it is confidently asserted cannot be taught mathematics if so the valet cretan is my cousin german my heart warms to him i am his transatlantic affinity he is the happier inasmuch as his little eccentricity is recognized and no tampering follows whereas i fell heir to years of crazy importunities i bethink me with anguish of so many precious hours spent between sunrise and sunset in compulsory handling of snaky arithmetical characters when i might have mastered the literature of timbuktu or successfully dug out in a mellower land the hoary toy pestles of little child astyanax it is drilled into my younger brethren and sistren such is their venerable and true english title that a cipher to right of them or a cipher to left of them under certain circumstances which happily i forget make vast differences with silly figures not one of the unfortunates is a stranger to such dogmas a visitor of classrooms with a proper dash of vinegar in him knows nevertheless that the tender geometric parrot prodigy shall scarce be taught some more curious problems why political bribery is not a state prison crime nor oppression of dumb beasts nor marriage o oh, tempora without love therefore the cretan wears his rue with a difference and is enviable he is not chained up simply because it is the general barbaric custom to the hard-grained muses of the cube and square that is 
not unless he gets astray on the educational world and finds it quite useless to proclaim his identity if any one take kindly to the black art as he might to the smallpox he must of course be humoured believe him sincerely mistaken perhaps he may not ripen into a college professor whose business it is to disseminate his evil lore perhaps heaven assoil him he may end of chapter eleven chapter twelve of goose quill papers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Cantoni Goose Quill Papers by Louise Imogen Guiney A Child in Camp Like the royal personages in the drama, I was ushered on the stage of life literally with flourish of trumpets. The Civil War was at its bursting point, the President calling for recruits. It was impertinent of me, but in that solemn hour I came a-crowing into the world. And since I was born under allegiance, a lady whom I learned to love with incredible quickness, O oh bella libertà, O oh bella, rocked my fortunate cradle. She gave me a little flag for toy instead of coral and bells, and filled my virginal ear with the classic strains of John Brown's body, ere yet I had heard a secular lullaby. She it was who dyed my infant mind in her own tricolor, and whose exciting companionship roused me surprisingly early into wide-awake consciousness and speculation. In laughing recognition of her old, old favor, these confused twilight memories, impressions of America, as it were, ab ovo, may be recorded. A young person, some twenty-four years my senior, for whom I had a violent liking, had preceded me to the wars. I saw his ship sail away at that exceedingly tender age when a human being is involved in mummy-like cerements and cannot properly be said to exist at all. In the winter of 1864, he had been away during that long interval, I enlisted and went south to visit him. I had thrived at home through the distended agony of those days. I had a general idea that my cue in life was to fight, and I would smile endearingly over a colored plate of the Battle of Trafalgar, whose smoky glare and indications of turmoil and slaughter were supremely to my mind. Read, however, by some process of mistaken zeal, I came to regard as inimical to the party to which, as catechumen, I belonged. I had not then a very copious vocabulary at my command, but I soon indicated my convictions by screeching like a young eagle at the most innocent auction flag that ever floated out of a Boston door of a sunny morning, or flushing with unmistakable wrath at a casual visitor who bore a trace of that outrageous color in anything worn or carried. It was long indeed before I was persuaded to transfer my misguided sentiment to A.D. 1775, and to believe that the neighboring rebel had no especial affinity with the hue in question. Prior to my memorable journey to Virginia, I had spent a few months in camp the year before. A slight epidemic ran the rounds of the tents and took in hours. The only recollection which survives is a vivid one of neighboring trees and a distant hill, visible as I lay facing the narrow door, a view which included the ever-flitting figure of the sentinel, his steady, silent tread, musket on shoulder, and the kind, rustic face and profile, which turned ever and anon, smilingly about, like the moon at her merriest. That welcome shadow which fell before him in the broad light was cut down in the ranks at Malvern Hill. But my earliest real experiences began in 64. Hostilities had been some weeks suspended, yet the headquarters of a southern regiment lay within gunshot, and thither my delighted terrors reverted. Was Jeff Davis lurking on the other bank of the stream? Might they creep over by night and fall upon us? If I should be allowed to venture alone into the thicket, would the fiery eyes of the Reb glare upon me? 
please could I settle difficulties with any little boy in the opposing camp in the admirable Roman fashion of whose precedent I was yet ignorant? How they would laugh, those bearded and epauletted guests of our exceptionally elegant log house, and how uproariously they often planted me, regardless of ink and paper, on the table, and toasted me in some cordial beverage until I pranced in glee. Be it humbly admitted that the freedom I enjoyed among officers and men of several organizations, and the indulgence which they showed, tended not to improve my scarce seraphic disposition. More than once I was called to order for some breach of discipline, the most venial of which were cutting the tent strings, hanging about the sentry and impeding his progress with efforts to relieve him of his musket, or concealing the drumsticks to postpone an anticipated signal. The dark-eyed young man to whom I owed allegiance, I, me, while life did last that league was tender, would exclaim with the awful sense of a newly acquired dignity, Disobey a colonel if you dare, and threaten me, not with vulgar deprivations of supper or trivial captivity in closets, but with a veritable court-martial for my predestined doom when I should be so bad again. Our family retinue consisted of a cook of jolly and rubicund exterior, and a pleasant lad who, among his other duties, cared for my glossy-coated Arabian and led him about like a circus master while I snatched a fearful joy upon his back. The memory of the former personage is embalmed in the fragrance of roast beef and mashed potatoes, edibles which he announced frequently with a melodramatic flourish and intonation never to be forgotten. Burly old bush! He had a quaint way of delivering his best things, stans pede in uno, with a sidelong light of the eye to let you into the secret of his rich hyperboles. Another favorite of mine was an adjutant, owner of two sociable King Charles Spaniels, which I was permitted to endow with portions of my supper, and which I visited as regularly as a country lover his sweetheart when the general evening relaxation set in. Captain J, too, stern, reticent, and little popular with his men, was strangely gentle to one that rode on his arm and fell asleep many a time at his knee. He was a fascinating storyteller and held my fancy longer than any soldier playmate of his day. He had the absolute confidence of my infallible young man. The old figure, true as steel, was made for him. They forbore to tell me, till long afterwards, that he fell, shot through and through, at the wilderness, with his face to the foe. He had a brother, a mere boy, whose sunny hair I can remember under the military cap. But him I may come across any hour, prosperous and sunny-haired still. The only other figures plain to my mind's eye are F., the sweet-mannered gentleman who took care of me in a long railway journey, S., the surgeon, maker of jokes and of whistles, W., who used to sing Malbrook s'en va t en guerre, with immense satisfaction to himself, at least, and C., an inveterate patriot, who gave his good right arm for the asking at touch of a cannonball. During that stay there was much gaiety and little mishap. My elders rode off to many a hunt, or held tournaments with all the tilting and fair lady smiles incidental, nay, essential, to their success. Twice, in the midst of less serious things, the men were called to sleep under arms. I can very well remember, another time, ominous talk of Mosby and his guerrillas, and a cloud of dust on the horizon, which seemed to betoken his restless squadron. But these were variations on a winter full of pastime, and uncommonly clement and merry. The campaign that followed was so arduous and involved such heavy losses that it is cheering to remember the hearty voices of old playfellows during that genial holiday, to take down the books they used to read from their anchorage on a shelf, and to treasure up the gay incidents that brightened their tragic story. I recall a waiter of exceeding blackness who impressed me in a Washington hotel, and a sandwich 
uncommonly sharp with mustard, obtained on the homeward journey at the Baltimore station, where the city seemed to turn out to feed the very hungry in my person, and nothing at all further beyond these unspiritual details till the war drew to a close. For then my best beloved soldier came home. He was terribly shattered with suffering and fatigue, how irrevocably hurt I knew not. If the stars had fallen from heaven to light upon his shoulders, the thunderbolt had fallen too, and the general's insignia was sealed with a mini-ball. After a series of escapes, thrilling enough for a dime novel, after a plunge, horse and man into a ravine, a solitary stampede in a swamp, the loss of a scabbard and a patch of clothing by the familiar brushing of a bomb, and a hole through a cap neatly made by an attentive sharpshooter, the charmed bullets had hit at last. It was my earliest glimpse of the painful side of the war, when he stood worn, pale, drooping, waiting recognition with a weary smile at the door of the sunny little house we all loved. Instantly, heedless of any persuasive arms or voices, I slipped headlong like a startled seal from the rocks and disappeared under the table. Such was my common mode of receiving strangers, and here, indeed, was a most bewildering and appalling stranger. In vain, my soldier called me by the most endearing names, and even the whimsical nomenclature of camp life failed to convince me that this was no imposition. I shut my disbelieving eyes and crouched on the carpet. For two long hours I did not capitulate, and then but warily. What was this specter with whom I must not frolic, on whose shoulders I must not perch, whose head bound in bandages I must not handle? What was he, in place of my old-time comrade, blithe and boyish, and how could he expect to inherit the confidence I had given to quite another sort of person? Unhallowed Dixie! How it had cozened me out of what I prized most! The wound that jarred upon me I quickly came to consider as an admirable distinction, and altogether proper and desirable. I longed to be shot in the interests of my native land, and presently, by the foot of Pharaoh, so I was, thanks to a pistol in the hands of a maladroit little neighbor. I underwent the ether sponge and the knife, and my chubby cheek displayed with pride the reduced facsimile of the parental scar. It was my day of jubilee, ere the cicatrice had vanished, when I might lean against that elder veteran's knee and recount Munchausen-like tales of our prowess in the war. I remember the shock of national loss when the president was assassinated, and after that the coming and going of army faces, some strange, some familiar. It was like Virginia once more to hear the band march serenading up the quiet street, to recognize hearty voices at the garden gate, to command my most dutiful to shoulder arms and right wheel, and, waking from slumber, to creep to the head of the stairs and surreptitiously greet dear M and B and broad-shouldered A as they passed below. Not only these my childish fancy saw, but there seemed to gather with them many, many others, bearing names that sometime had been cited in my presence from the bright annals of Massachusetts, and out of their syllables I framed a ghostly pageant, following ever, like a breath of wind, close on the footsteps of their living peers. The dream cohorts, too, smiled up at me, and swept by. Trenmore came, the tall form of vanished years, his blue hosts behind him. I went to camp several times thereafter, though never with my own brigade, but having outlived its enchantment, inasmuch as I were now conscious of playing soldier merely, I took a stand on my war record and decided to withdraw from the militia. That was long ago. But the old prepossessions are immortal. The smell of powder is sweeter to me than oriental lilies. I resent the doctrine of absorption into the restful bosom of Brahma. An it please you, I aspire to Mars. 
I used to love the sight of those shabby warriors, dolefully bewailing their forlorn condition and mildly suggesting their eligibility to a bounteous dinner who prowled in long succession about our side door. I thrilled with indignation at their counterfeited wrongs. I brought them my sweetmates to throw a halo about their sober meal. Do I not take kindly yet to the battered coat bedizened with bright buttons on the back of M, grimy vendor of coal? Do I not encourage the handsome charges of our grocer solely because I know his antecedents and can trace his limp to Ball's bluff? It was an article of belief in my utopian childhood that a soldier could do no wrong. It went hard with me in my eleventh year to catch a glimpse of the silver Maltese cross, the badge of the impeccable Fifth Corps, on the breast of a scowling state prisoner, the hero shorn of his beams. His arm no longer rested on a howitzer. He wielded a crowbar. He might have hallowed Libby or Andersonville with his passing, and now, O oh, Absalom, the warden, the benignant warden, himself of the trade of war, did he know what he was doing when he assured me that the cells were peopled with ex-federal knights? Men have tried vainly to restore the lost completeness of the glorious statue of Melos. Even so, with a broken faith, what it might have been is out of the province of diviners. End of chapter 12. Recording by Linda Cantoni. Chapter 13 of Goose Quill Papers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisanne Lavoy of Swansea, Illinois. Goose Quill Papers by Louise Imogene Guiney On Graveyards A kindness for graveyards and a superadded leaning to the old, battered, weed-grown ones are not incompatible with the cheeriest spirit. A marked distinction is to be drawn between the amateur and the professional haunter of the chemetrion, the place of sleep. If the pilgrimage among marbles cannot be an impersonal matter, pray, sweet reader, keep to the courts of the living. The intolerable pain of meeting with some clear-cut beloved name, the chance of stumbling on some parody of the departed, under a glass case, or of brushing against the clayey sexton, fresh from his delving, these are things whose risk one would not willingly run. Therefore, Stick to antiquities, and let thy fastidious eye look with favor at no carven mortuary date that was cut later than under the third of the Georges. If there be a suspicion of Scotch granite, or of landscape gardening in any God's acre as thou passest by, turn thee about to windward. But where there stand, in honest slate, armorial ensigns, gaping cherubs, and cheerful sighs and hourglasses, labeled, as a child labels his drawing, this is a cow, with memento mori, or the scarcely less admirable truism, fugit aura, then enter in and read that chronicle, with its grassy margin, which the centuries have written. Here is the great dormitory. Here sits the little god, Hopocrates, swinging on the lotus leaf, his finger on his lips. No noise here but the toning of a tear. Thousands possess the earth in peace. Are not Spurius Cassius and the Gracchi vindicated when the agrarian law prevails at last? How paltry a thing is a monument to the dead, save as expressing the affection of survivors, Cannot the liberal soil absorb, without comment, the vast number of lives so sadly inessential to the world's growth and beauty? It must needs forever be placarded to the stranger, who would fain not be critical concerning the failings of these old hearts, where John Smith lies, 
It is not the chisel which keeps the memory alive. An inscription is superfluous for him whose deeds are graven in the book of life. Many another, who has but elbowed his way selfishly through the world, is laid under all the figures of rhetoric, and is beholden to nothing better than an obelisk to speak him fair. To be but pyramidally extant, says Sir Thomas Brown, is a fallacy in duration. A monument, a stone to a bone, shows the turbinus of the corporeal journey and serves merely to mark the gateway through which something perishable that was dear has passed away. Think of the gloomy, pessimistic habit of the Puritan colonists surmounting every grave with a grinning skull in tracery when the benighted pagans, ages before, crushed out the material aspect of death beneath chaplets of roses, amaranth, and myrtle. Imagery of the liberated insect leaping to the sun with impetuous wings, posy full of hopefulness and cheer, and the symbolic figure of an inverted torch over the burial pile. It might disparage the acrid sanctity of the forefathers to ask which of the two seemed worthiest to inherit immortality. Cotton Mather, after his whimsical fashion, pronounces it as the best eulogy of Ralph Partridge the first shepherd of the old Duxborough flock, that being distressed at home by the ecclesiastical setters, he had no defense, neither beak nor claw, but flight over the ocean, that now being a bird of paradise, it may be written of him, that he had the loftiness of the eagle and the innocency of the dove. His epitaph is, A vol la vie. The most exquisite epitaph I ever saw was one of an infant of German extraction who died at the notable age of sixteen months. Beloved and respected by all who knew him, well nigh as pompous and as plausible is an obituary in favor of a similar lambkin, yet to be deciphered at Copse Hill. He bore a lingering sickness with patience, and met ye, king of terrors, with a smile. One Abigail Dudley sleeps in a New England village under a white stone, professionally indicative of her moral character. A widow droops in effigy over a Plymouth tomb, and states in large capitals that she has lost an agreeable companion. Nearby is the harrowing script, Father, Parted Below, and its sequel a yard's length off, Mother, united above. It flashes across your brain like a revelation of vandal atrocities. What wondrously sweet lines old English poets wrote over the graves of women and children. Think of Carew's Darling in an Urn, of Ben Jonson's Elizabeth, of Sidney's sister Pembroke's mother, of Drummond's Margaret, of Herrick's On a Maid, every word precious as a pearl, and of the holy startling pathos wherewith one now without a name bewailed his friend. If such goodness live amongst men, bring me it, I shall know then, she is come from heaven again. General Charles Lee, that sad revolutionary rogue, wrote in his last will and testament, I do earnestly desire that I may not be buried in any church or churchyard or within a mile of any Presbyterian or Anabaptist meeting house. For since I have resided in this country, I have kept so much bad company while living that I do not choose to continue it when dead. Of Roger Williams, who was also granted solitary sepulture, a strange tale is told. There was question some years back of transplanting him from his sequestered resting place to a stately mausoleum. The diggers dug, and the beholders beheld, what? Not any received version of that which was he, but the roots of an adjacent apple tree formed into a netted oval, indented with punctures not wholly unlike human features, parallel branches lying perpendicularly on either side, fibers intertwined over a central area, and lastly, two long sprouts 
knotted halfway down and terminating in a petiform excrescence, wonderful to see. It was plain, thought the savants of P, that the apple tree had eaten of ancient Roger. Now who had eaten of the fruit of that apple tree? Verily, to what base uses may we return? It was said of old by the English Chrysostom, A man shall read a sermon, the best and most passionate that ever was preached. Will he but enter into the sepulchre of kings? Let a tourist go through Europe from town to town, pausing in the porches of burial grounds. Shall he not touch the naked candor of governments and follow the hoary chronicle of ages backward with his Hebraic eye? To him, the graveyard moss that eats out the character of proud names is a sage commentator on mundane fame and the humble mound to which genius and virtue have lent their blessed association inspires him with precepts beyond all philosophy. For history is not a clear scroll, but a palimpsest, and he who is versed only in the autography of his contemporaries misses half the opportunity and half the gladness of life. The habit of providing for personal comfort anticipates an easy couch and a fair prospect for us at the end. How many men from the royal warriors of yore, who willed their ashes to be carried into a faraway country, have chosen and jealously guarded in thought their tomorrow's place of rest? A superfluous care when the unawaited waves of ocean have cradled thousands, and every battlefield opens to receive the staunch and strong. Even for the sake of mysterious beauty, such as hath thy holy hill, Concordia, alert youth itself might harbor a not ungentle welcoming thought of death. Yet that head which is confident of quiet sleep is scarce solicitous of its pillow. One last assurance vibrates, like triumphant music, in ears impatient of much speech upon a text so sacred. To live indeed, it echoes, is to be again ourselves, which being not only a hope, but an evidence in noble believers, it is all one to lie in St. Innocent's churchyard, as in the sands of Egypt, ready to be anything, in the ecstasy of being ever, and as content with six feet as with the moles of Adrianus. End of chapter 13. Recording by Lassan Lavoie. Chapter 14 of Goose Quill Papers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Dyer. Goose Quill Papers by Louise Imogen Guini. Some Garden Folk. The snail is a kind hearted, happy go lucky creature. Carrying his house with him, he leaves no cares at home. He is otium cum dignitate. He is the moral antipode of the ant. He shirks responsibilities and he turns the cold shoulder on labor and fret. Deliberation, calmness of intellect, consciousness of superiority are in his slow majestic tread. So that he gets to the place in mind, it is of no possible consequence how long the journey may be. The crystal day is all his own. He is the nabob, a gentleman of leisure, and considers haste vulgar, and proper only to grasshoppers and miserable sparrows. Rosebugs are impertinent. Hummingbirds, bright and beautiful, come too seldom amongst our flowers of June, but the bees come instead and burden the air with their soothing baritone. Yet the bees have a way of pressing personal souvenirs upon you. Pray you avoid it, as Hamlet tells the players. Caterpillars fascinate a spectator. They are full of mysterious interest, birthed in their soft cocoons, deftly caught on to the jagged edges of stone walls or bent on traveling from leaf to leaf with their many twinkling feet in full motion. A caterpillar, however varied and attractive his coloring, 
is not a favorite with society, or with that branch of which it goes about in bonnets and high-heeled boots. Moralists, rather, shall befriend him, the kind little creeper, and treat him with that reverence which the knowledge of his coming glories inspires. The earthworm is the pariah of garden folk. His appearance, primarily, is against him. He looks like an intriguer, an uneasy, officious sinner, wriggling his crooked way through the world. The inadvertent step, which Cowper would fain spare him, ends too often our groundling's peregrinations. He is born to be disregarded and abused. A child, whose protective instincts are yet dormant, will decimate him for the pleasure of seeing his posthumous remnants take up their separate lives and unconcernedly disperse. Worm is a reputed political exile. With his greater cousin, the snake, he shares the popular odium of Aaron's Isle. I have heard an old fellow, mowing grass, turn about to tell an incredulous companion that, if by any chance, one could put a bit of Irish soil, nay, so small a thing as a shamrock, under a Yankee worm, that instant would be the death of him. The legend is given in that very quaint Lives of the Saints, which Wharton thinks was written in the 12th century. Quote, Say in Paderic, corn thorough goddess grace to preach in Irelanda, to teach man the right, believe Jehu Christa, to understanda, so fill of worms that Londa he found that no man might gone, in some stead for worms that he nas winamide anon. St. Patrick bade our Lord Christ that the land delivered were of thilk foul wormus that none ne come there. End, quote. End of chapter 14. Chapter 15 of Goose Quill Papers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amelia Chesley. Goose Quill Papers by Louise Imogen Guinea. Hospitalities. It does the heart good to read of some light-footed troubadour or reverend pilgrim trudging from gate to gate all the way across a strange country, everywhere welcome as an expected guest, and given the liberty of the host's kingdom. Chroniclers give us pretty pictures of the household sitting about the dusty palmer, listening to his pious and spirited homily, of the errant singer wrapped in his worn velvet cloak, delighting young maids and children with the old burden of Ronscavales or with the tale of that dreamer Rudel, who crossed seas to find his unseen lady love at Tripoli, and to die satisfactorily in her arms. Whether the master of the castle had subsequent cause to regret the shelter proffer to his birds of passage, posterity shall never learn. For those were the days of chivalry, and the brave bounty which accepted the wayfarers without question was able to overlook a deficiency, if such there were, in the family silver. Of this best sort, too, was the hospitality of Alcinius to Ulysses, treating him like a king, and dreaming not of his hidden kingliness. Spanish courtesy yet keeps a show of heart-whole giving. This is thy house, an Andalusian tells his visitor. An Indian, in his forest wigwam, does yet better. If he abide you at all, with your scalp at its accustomed altitude, he tenders whatsoever he calls his, and would scorn to conceal from you the innermost recesses of his savage larder. Is he not hospitable? quaintly asks one of our American essayists, who entertains thoughts. Think of the unlicensed generosity of the Robertsmen, dealing out what had but just become theirs by right of might, and of our niggardly modern dispensation, of that Duke of Newcastle, the lavish splendor of whose receptions bewildered all England, or of another social peer, Edward, Earl of Derby, in whose grave since 1572, said Thomas Fuller, hospitality hath in a manner been laid asleep. Timon began as bravely as any of these, waiving all formal recognition of his royal liberality. He made his frank exordium in the banquet hall. My lord's ceremony was but devised at first to set a gloss on faint teeds, hollow welcomes, recanting goodness, sorry ere tis shown. But where there is true friendship, there needs none. Pray sit. 
Hospitality hath been called threefold, for one's family, of necessity, for strangers, of courtesy, for the poor, of charity. Friendship pushes its privilege to the broad extreme and loses its sense of ownership. Cot or cabin have I none, and sing the more that thou hast one. The twin playwrights of the reign of Queen Bess set up their tent on the bankside, alternately wearing the same clothes and cloaks, and having but one bench of the house between them, which the twain did so much admire. A guest should be permitted to graze, as it were, in the pastures of his host's kindness, left even to his own devices like a rational being, and handsomely neglected. Our merry friend, T., who has been known to beat his breast and groan while passing a certain suburban house, whose inmates consider themselves his devoted friends. It seems that on his last visit he found only the ladies of the establishment at home, ardent, solicitous creatures whose good manners were nearly the death of him. He had a mind to await their brother's return, and while the fair Araminta was gathering roses on the terrace and her sister had momentarily vanished indoors, our tender innocent, pleased with the landscape, and not averse to bodily comfort, incontinently got into the hammock. He had barely begun to sway to and fro in his idle fashion, when delicate expostulations smote his incredulous ear. He learned, with respectful awe, that he was liable to headache, to seasickness, to certain and sudden thuds on the floor of the piazza, and lastly to influenza and kindred ills, by facing the formidable summer atmosphere in a recumbent position, without wrap or shawl. The climax was capped by the wheeling forward of a portly armchair and the persuasive order to take that and be comfortable. T was too dazed or too shy to protest. When he sought a cool seat in the bay window, down came the sash for fear of a draught. He made bold to caress the dog, and Nero was led away and chained to his kennel because he was apt to bite. He fell in to his infinite diversion with the junior member of the household, and Master was marched off to bed with the stern bidding to be a good boy and not trouble the gentleman. Like sorrows hovered over him till the blessed hour of release, B was back at seven and wondered why his old classmate had gone. Who does not envy them that knew Henry Wotton, a very great lover of his neighbors, a bountiful entertainer of them, very often at his table, where his meat was choice and his discourse better. Or the bohemian spirits of four inner temple lane, with the card tables drawn out, the fire crackling, the long sixes lit, the snuff boxes ready for anyone's handling, the kettle singing on the hob, glasses and bottles and cold viands within reach, books lying about, familiar guests doing what they pleased, chatting, reading, coming, going, veritable at homes with a sense of slippered, almost slipshod ease. But hold, are we to indict a disquisition on the decay of hospitality? Are there no open hearts above ground, nor any houses where the elected comer may still hold the key to every room, with no direful bluebeard exclusions? Leaving dives to the practice or omission of a virtue, eminently appropriate to his coffers, what of the very poor? For there is a paradoxical extravagance in their way of life, a glorious communism between one that is needy and one whom he discovers day on day to be needier than himself. Where have they learned that sweet readiness of succor? The churl with them is he who withholds his little superfluity from a more miserable brother. In the close kinship of suffering, their souls grow mutually pitying, mutually helpful, clinging each to the rest as a coral atom is moored to the patient island, built from the incalculable depths of the sea. If the wealth that is gracious and thoughtful should vanish tomorrow from the earth, generous giving should find its home in the thin, kind hands of poverty. And then, as now, should some bright-eyed student arise to deny the asservation of history that the noble old hospitallers are no more. End of chapter 15、Chapter 16
Down a tranquil country road I walked in a reverie one April Sabbath afternoon. I seemed to be in a strange land, and pictures and fancies of Meano and the Tyrol were floating in my brain. Yet I was unconsciously moving like a drowsy star in the old, old orbit, whence I had never strayed, within brief distance of the spot where I was born, and where for years my life had worked itself into so dear a bondage that the desire of journeying gladly elsewhere, save in the spirit, had become a sort of treason. The air was laden with the moist, delicious fragrance of early spring, which comes as yet from nothing but the ground, as if the persuasive showers had stirred and awakened the very clods and roots and buried fragments of leaves into something like hope and aspiration. This is the advent time of nature, far more touching and suggestive than the imminent beauty whereof it is the forerunner. As I ventured onward, wrapped in solitary thought, and resolved, as it were, into the sweet indolent joy of living, I stooped to pick up a branch, silvered with thick buds, which the wind had blown across my path. At that moment, distracted from the invisible world, and in the transition state between dreaming and alert attention, I was saluted with a strain of exquisite music, such as one can conceive of as floating ever in Jeremy Taylor's blessed country, where an enemy never entered, and whence a friend never went away. I raised my head to listen, and immediately perceived ahead of me, back from the highway, and embowered in trees, a grey church porch, out of which were ushered the interlacing harmonies which had charmed my wandering ear. The door stood open, and no idlers were in sight. No late wheel marks were betrayed on the soft, fine dust of the road. Yet by the many-coloured sunlight filtered through the costly windows of the nave, I saw that a number of people were gathered together in the cool and quiet edifice. A single glance showed me that the interior was of extreme beauty, and of precisely that delicacy and airiness of design most unlikely to be coupled with massive granite walls. Yet there it was, impregnably grim without, peaceful and assuring within, like a kindly heroic heart beating under armor. From it, and about it, and through it, floated the siren voices of my search. In an illusion-loving mood, I sought not to pluck out the heart of my mystery, nor to rob it of its soft promise by vain questionings. I slipped into a deserted seat in the shadow of the choir stairs, and gave myself up to this sole delight. As to prayers and sermons, either they were already over, or else they went past in the lapses of melody, as the swallows by the window above me, beating their shining way upward, utterly without my knowledge or furtherance. I heard, above the rest, and sometimes intertwined only with each other, a brave, jubilant voice, and a voice steadfast and tender. Neither know I which was the fairer, so ministrant were both, so helpful and unfailing. The soft, starlit voice might touch an overeager soul with calm, to the soul distressed, the strong voice would come like a great noontide wind, impelling it towards the height where the sun dwelt and all the fountains of the day. Clear as thought was the bright voice, striving, surmounting, and instinct with truth. But like the first sigh of passion was the sad voice, thrilling, too, with memories of yesterdays that cannot return forever. Fond, sensitive, dedicated to the deep recesses of the heart, where there is search after hidden meanings, and mourning over the inscrutable laws through which not even love's anointed eyes can see. I recognize the battle call, the rush of the wings of the morning, the paean of young ambition in the victor voice, whose very petition was a conquest, in the irresistible faith and strength of its asking. But the lowly voice sang with unspeakable pathos, in whose every plea the greater grief of rejection was already apprehended. A grateful spirit would fain bestow on the glorious voice an ardent welcome, and on the gentle voice a lingering caress. Both I loved, and unto both my soul hearkened, for they were the voices of angels, and one was joy, and one was peace. Then, as in a vision, I beheld a fair prospect before me, and in the center of its green beauty arose two hills, from whose separate summits the voices ruled perennially showering blessings, healing sorrow, banishing care, cheering and solacing the earth. 
now the weak needed not to rely on the strong and pity and protection were scarcely asked or given for music the most divine striker of the senses music alone was the arbitress of the world and all day past twilight into the deep gloom were the voices singing not incapable of being wearied but revivified forever by the smiles and tears of pilgrims who departed from the hilltop with hearts made whole i marked that the little children were drawn frequently to the abode of the melancholy voice because it was soft and weird like a gypsy mother's lullaby or the rustle of aspens in serene weather thither also came youth nursing its first grief with willful indulgence and manhood yearning for summer melodies that should soothe all unrest and close tired eyelids over tired eyes but i knew the babes were there only because of the sweet curious affinity of childhood with sombre influences and the young palmers through some sophistry of love and honor and the strong workers overwrought since there was no courage left for self-invigoration and no guide to help them towards the city of the cordial voice whither they should have turned one i saw coming forth from the field with a scroll under his arm pale and worn with glimpses of incomprehensibles and thoughts of things which thoughts do but tenderly touch who stood a moment wrapped in rash delight at the voice which betokened tears and infinite longing and regret and who straightway remembering that the poet's mission is gladness incessant belief and prophecy of good betook him albeit with a sigh to that other abiding place where he might learn of the happy voice all the afflicted with the wild and doleful steps sought to climb the dolorous mountain towards the setting sun and often a friend's strong hand intervened and led them rather with inspiring speech into the land of healing i watched time on time soldiers marching to the wars sustained by the glad voice and hastening forwards with its spell upon them like a consecration and again the weary troops returning with tattered colors and broken ranks pausing in the lovely courts of the grave voice to chant with it a song of memory and reparation and thanksgiving i came to understand though but slowly and confusedly that the entire universe was swayed by these voices and that while each was best in its holy office the strong voice was that which nerved us to our duty and the kind voice that which rewarded us for duty done always within hearing of them we travel towards the ampler day loyal to one until we have merited the loving offices of the other holding them sweetly correlative even as our labor and repose or life and death so soon as i was filled with the glory and significance of the voices they faded imperceptibly away and i heard them no longer moreover i found my lifted eye resting anew on the village church where the dying light fell across the aisles and the bare clematis vine waved at the near window and whence the last worshipper had departed had i indeed been on a strange road and among strange sounds it may be that even in my daydream i might have called my beloved singers by their earthly names and that so i might this hour were it not for a clinging scruple for i have been made wiser and know verily that both are angels and that one is joy and one is peace end of chapter 16、Chapter、seventeen of good school papers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Gusco Papers by Louise Imogen Guigny. Sweetheart. In a mood made half of tenderness and half of laughter, I begin to speak of her. In tenderness, since to name her is a joy. And in laughter, for that I cannot for sure and ability keep the knowledge of her to myself. Hardly because she had many legions of lovers who sung of her aloud to tell tale winds before I found my way to her blessed door, but most of all because it would strangely savor of injustice to appropriate so sweet a thing as her favor, without sharing it with the first comer found worthy. Therefore, this delight of mine is no more mine than thine, and his, and theirs, and ours, and who would have it otherwise? She dwelt abode in a tranquil vale apart from villages, with little society save that of the scholar tanager and the periwinkle blossom. Such visitors as entered the piney aisles that led into her presence were those only that reverenced her truly. She could not abide harshness and scorn, and they were always gentle, 
she sat in her fragrant solitude as one that broods on mysteries and they in sympathy sat beside her one by one and spake ever after with the enthusiasm and unworldliness of children but the immaculate stillness which she chose for her dwelling has long been assailed revelers came from the city to riot in her gardens and to disport themselves in her halls railway trains thundered hourly over her in her hallowed threshold often and often in passing by you may yet hear the sound of inharmonious voices and catch a glimpse of her fair downcast brow as she looks mutely upon the invaders amid this heavy change she is unchanged and unchangeable her pure serenity was a sharp rebuke to our doubting when we first gathered around her after the dread of missing the charm which had made her dear we had known many of her kindred and each of them howsoever lonely seemed coarsened and cheap into the sensitive eye by overmuch familiarity of crowds but our celestial lady moves like penelope amid throngs of false suitors with thoughts entangled from their glamour and forbearance and patience and hope and honour the ineffable depths of her nature ever more enjoyed long ago in the beginning of affection for her we twain found her asleep in the fluted noonday sunshine having at her feet and at her head a some guard of pines and behind them the vagrant glad-like green of spring and again above their topmost pennon irregular amethyst clouds visionary mountain ranges that climbed peak on peak to front the lincoln on thy sovereign hill we flung ourselves in the young grass and delayed there lest our footsteps should break that exquisite slumber and so awed and so rejoiced looked upon her whom we have travelled far to see it was her exceeding comeliness that made the responsive gleam dance from eye to eye but it was her sanctity virginal as when the spirit first breathed upon it and bade it be that held our lips hushed and our memory secure and different ever after over this unforgotten glory of ours san francis of Assisi might have breathed his soft hymn of thanksgiving for my sister was very humble useful precious and chaste cram should be wary of her bright presence wherein i should forget his landmarks dreaming beside her novels overwrought and embittered should take courage and trust the world anew as by miracle for her sake many many times but especially at the breaking of the frost when sap begins to thrill in the naked belts comes a desire to approach her peaceful abiding place and learn by moon and sun what more winsomeness or splendour one year halt brought her what more can it ever bring for her soul is crystalline and candid and on her forehead shines perpetual youth she is one of the touchstones of our finer selves verily with the secluded friend of friends in profanity we are absent in holiness near in sin estranged in innocence reconciled her history is in hearts rather than in books her unprofitable beauty is the special care of heaven and we new englanders that love her and sometimes come about her harping her praises with sweet extravagance have no name for her which men shall recognize but that of wald and water end of chapter seventeen Chapter 18 of Goose Quill Papers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Dyer. Goose Quill Papers by Louise Imogen Guini. On the Beauty of Idleness. Idleness is harder to distinguish than the Philosopher's Stone. Stupidity you can put your finger on, and so with sullenness, daydreaming, or bovine lassitude. But idleness may link itself with any, all, or none of these. It is the will-o'-the-wisp among human characteristics. You avoid it, being hoodwinked as to its presence in your vicinage. You bear with it in others, when your tolerance is veritably bestowed on something very different. Small wonder if you wax so wise and so finical that you shall swear, sooner or later, in the phrase of a certain friend of ours, that there never was no sitch a thing. What astronomy is to astrology, or chemistry to the alchemy of old times, that is idleness, so-called, the most useful and edifying spectacle in the world, to idleness criminal. Idleness, Simon Pure, from which all manner of good springs like seed from a fallow soil, is sure to be misnamed and misconstrued, even when it is stuck, like a billpost in the public eye. A thinking person, the schoolmaster will allow you, is barely to be called idle. 
But for that exaggeration of thought, the almost tidal standstill between activities, which belongs to Dunce on the back bench, he has no more respect that can fit in the circumference of his rod. Dunce, nevertheless, may grow up to be called Oliver Goldsmith, or Arthur, Duke of Wellington. Tommy, who stops on his way to the market to sit on a stone wall and plan a nest robbing, indulgent passers-by shall consider busy, though misguided. But young Galileo or Columbus, planning nothing whatsoever, drifting into the mental hush and stillness whence astonishing ideas arise, are sure to be set up as a couple of intolerable wool-gatherers. A boy may crouch before the fire, looking through the kettle steam at one far-off divine event, and be complimented on his prospective value to society, or ironically offered a penny for the contents of his ridiculous head. Thoreau put his own case in the illustration of the man who roves all day through a pine forest, rejoicing in its height and shade and fragrance, and is heralded far and wide as a lazy good-for-naught, as opposed to the sober and industrious citizen who betakes himself, axe in hand, to hew the giants down. Every township has its businessmen, but Mr. Henry Thoreau was, without exception, the best American idleness man on record. He floated about in his dory, the breathing reflection of nature in its wealth of detail, inflated with pride because he had not ever chosen to stand behind a counter. Yet he got his living by loving, and may be suspected of having grained his name, diamond-like, on that window which looks out eastward on the Atlantic. How else was half the wisdom of the Orient cradled, but in the solemn Buddhist, coiled up with his sealed eyelids, his shut teeth and parted lips, contemplating nothing with tremendous suavity? The secret of handsome leisure is a fast secret now, indeed. The ancients have not transmitted it. Who can think of a breathless Athenian, save in the hour of battle, or of manly sport? Pericles laid the fold of his garment so deliberately over his arm, and steadied himself against some calm assurance, marching, as the old chronicler said of Queen Bess, with leisure. Repose is stamped on every statue the Greeks left us. It is in their lyrics, however joyous, in their large drama, in their golden history. They did nothing in feverish haste. Perhaps it may not be rash to acknowledge that they were reasonably clever and managed their terrene concerns with some intelligence. There is overmuch stir around us, mountains heaving, cities building, seasons racing by, governments shifting and turning at the four corners of the earth. It is the modern miracle that the contemporaneous growing lilies have not lost their blessedness in striving to toil and spin. Wherever a soul keeps energy in reserve and a little healthful languor dominant, a patch of Arcadia is yet to be found. Quote, Oblivion here thy wisdom is, thy thrift, the sleep of cares. For a proud idleness like this, crowns all thy mean affairs. End quote. When the familiar Yankee angel, nervous prostration, brushes you with his wing, Arcadia withers away. Your holiday siesta, after that, is not genuine. Of idleness you cannot be conscious, even as innocence is no longer itself when it knows its name. Therefore no weekday preacher need exhort you to be idle, ladies and gentlemen, as often as you can afford it. He can only cast an eye along your ranks, and discovering one or two of the elect who shall remind him of boats swinging gently at their moorings, piously hold his tongue and go on his way with thanksgiving. End of chapter 18「
Recording by Adrian Stevens. Goosequa Pipers by Louise Imogen Guini. De Moschitone. If the Bruce loved his instructive spider, for which history does not vouch, why should not the public mosquito be dear to desponding minds as a yet more victorious exponent of the value of perseverance and a set purpose? Who hath circumvented her? She laughs at all dissuasion. She evades the soldier's gun, the physician's potion, the Sophie with his fleet cannot drive her away, nor the Tsar impale her in any dungeon. What the mosquito came hitherward to do, that she does. The moral runs at large. It is all very well to abuse her. One gets a poor childish satisfaction out of such terms of endearment as can be readily bestowed. Unfledged Tamerlane, disturber of the sanctities of night, Satan of summer joys, and so on. What avails all that? We have to bow our necks and endure her diabolics. She is an evil which the Constitution cannot remedy, and as we are given to understand that she does not speak English, no protest formulated in that tongue can pierce her horny and tyrannical heart. A believing soul may picture her primarily in some sweet decorous frolic through the glades of Eden, for charity would even accord to her the possibility of a state of first innocence, frisking airily with birds of paradise, and given wholly to honourable practices. Ah, but what a man is proof against violent thoughts of Father Noah, who, when she had already entered on her vainglorious, flesh-loving, back-biting, and peace-disturbing career, gave her shelter of his house through troublous days, and like the short-sighted philanthropist that he was, cursed the four continents in befriending two obstreperous insects. I cannot consider any cosmic force more eminently practical. The poet lords a river bank and sheds on a grove the starry fascinations of rhetoric. It is none other than Mosquito who induces you to hate and shun what you would fain be persuaded to consider fair. She it is who can make the greenest landscape odious and the calm haunts of trees vociferous as if all bedlam were let loose under their outspread arms. She is your best circumnavigator. I cannot picture, to my wildest speculations, a place where she is not. Nowhere is she in exile, but hath her native bog all over Christendom. She holds her cannibalistic orgies wherever human foot hath trodden. In that land which, geographically, is no man's, methinks she prowleth still looking for him. Howsoever arrant a folly it be to ignore so great an influence on our personal behaviour, so huge a factor in the reckoning of men's woes, little enough is recorded of this wretched Anthropophaginian. Dante did weakly, inasmuch as she figured not as chief tormentor among his perpetually condemned. The cricket, the glowworm, the ant, the mole, long since found their bards, but no prophetic malediction has fallen from Parnassus on their evil-minded cousin. There must needs be a greater than Milton to pronounce her anathema. The immense malignity of her disposition is, with superlative cunning, cloaked under her bodily slenderness and aerial grace. What monstrous discrepancy betwixt her and her doings! By what unheard-of perverseness in the natural order is she framed delicately as a kind sunbeam or a fragment of sea-foam? On the theory of physical degeneracy, we may consider her, in the archetypal plan, to have been a grim enormity, like Regulus's Bagrada serpent, a candidate of yore for the attentions of some Jack the Giant Killer, who, should he arise today, might prove but a clumsy blunderer in face of her impish agilities. Helpless victim that I am, I look at Mosquito with unmixed awe. I harbour grotesque superstitions, and build up romances in her name. Why not metempsychosis? This marvellous restlessness, might it not once have been a human thing? What if some world scourge, like Attila, were pent in these narrow bounds, and sent whirring through space again on the old colossal mission of annoyance? Involuntarily, I scan Mosquito with no humbler glass than a telescope, even to the dignity of a malignant planet hath she attained in mine unjaundiced eye. 
straightway as fear building on fear mount my fancies, memories, speculations, till on their topmost pinnacle flashes the saying of the liberal philosophers that the immortal principle may not be lacking in the, quote, meanest thing that feels, unquote, and my sole, honest, overwhelming impulse is to forswear the pious Sunday school hope of becoming an angel, that is, a winged creature, lest in any phase of untried being, mosquito, I should bear affinity to that which thou art. Quote, Execrable shape, thou darest, though grim and terrible, advance, thy miscreated front across my way. End quote. Is it not an apostrophe to thee? What fiend was it yesterday moved my shuddering lips to quote that gentlest strophe over thy flattened corpusculum, meant peradventure for a kindlier spirit? Quote, my sprightly neighbour, gone before, to that unknown and silent shore, shall we not meet as heretofore some summer morning? End quote. Such is the irony of revenge. Dread reminiscence, appalling probability, disconcerting and inescapable fact thou art the inscrutable the unattainable the never reached i take it off the metaphysical circle in deference to thee i salute the hem of a mosquito net in the watches of the night my soul shall rejoice to behold thy wrathful eye outside end of chapter 19Chapter 20 of Goosequill Papers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adrian Stevens. Goosequill Papers by Louise Imogen Guini. On the Garret. Quote, I scorn your land, so far it lies below me. Here I see how all the sacred stars do circle me. Unquote. Henry Vaughan. There survives in certain men a climbing instinct, a persistence dating from Babel days, which keeps them to the belief that they were meant to be, in Spencer's phrase, neighbours to the sky. Put them down in a city, and they mount by choice, as by force of circumstances, oil-like, over the gross mass. These are the garret dwellers, disburdened, for the most part, of the money-bags of capitalists. Surely, the more a creature is denuded of riches and responsibilities, the lighter his spiritual weight, the fitter he is for nearing the unembarrassed planets. He is no underling. His poverty literally raises him up. He marches, like a conqueror, towards some fine deserted city, into the high places. His castle is over against the morning, and his bare forehead is reared above the hereditary crowns of Europe. That the rich should be the groundlings, after all, is one of the diverting sarcasms and counterturns of society. Who would not, rather, stand playfellow to the sun and consider the moon's light nothing less familiar than a beneficent household elf and suffer the companionship of the rainbow and of snows? Distant and faint sounds the thunder of the streets, Teufelstrock, and such as he, quote, sit above it alone with the stars, unquote. Nethermost darkness cannot overtake the denizen of the garret. His matins are over and done while candles still flicker below. The wail of the banshee reaches not his far-removed ear. No flood in civic highways appalls him. The tramp of armies, likewise, is beneath him, and he overlooks revolutions undisturbed. For him... Perpetually are ultra-mundane joys, the coragium of the spheres, and the revelations of the shifting air. The conjurer and astronomer alike love the high lonely tower. The painter goes thither for light, the student for contemplation. There, according to international traditions, is the poor author perennially to be found, quote, lulled by soft zephyrs through the broken pane, unquote. The poor author, the saving leaven of literature, here is his native heather, and not elsewhere. Here his latitude must be taken. If ghosts revisit their whilom kingdoms, here Otway, Addison, Dryden, Chatterton, Hood, Beranger flock some time or other. 
Here you shall brush against the shade of Marvel, who dwelt thus high and thus solitary, when the king's deputies came with unavailing gifts in their hands to buy his favour, and presently dear Oliver Goldsmith shall turn his homely face upon you, and tell you, in his delightful voice, as he once blurted it out before the elegant circles of Sir Joshua's, how he lived happily among the beggars in Axe Lane. In a garret sat Tasso, whimsically beseeching his cat, to lend to his nocturnal labours the guiding radiance of her eyes, having no candle whereby to write his verses. Dickens, who was never a poor author, caught at least something of his privilege in his sky-nest, with the clouds and the birds shadowing his study windows in their passage. As the dwellers in the happy valley were daily entertained with tales and songs which treated of their own felicity therein, so we know of nothing more judicious than to sound the praises of the ever-noble Garrett to the poor author, who has an eternal patent on its worth and beauty. The least that can be said of it is that it engenders the philosophy of comment. Its kind soil fosters the spectator and the observer, in default of the commoner weed. The muse, traditionally coy, can be caught there, if anywhere, she has been known to neglect her votaries in proportion to the fattening of their purses and the proximity to the first-floor drawing-room. A poet himself has marked it as a warning, quote, A man must live in a garret aloof to keep the goddess constant and glad. End quote. Long residence in its precincts, howbeit, may tend to produce a haughty disregard of the brethren acclimated to lower levels. Your roof-perching hermit, whose lungs are inflated with rude health, scoffs at the genteel ailments accruing below from the largesses of carbonic acid gas. His own deus-like elevation breeds arrogance in him and patrician scorn. His descent to the vantage ground of the majority is palpable indeed. He cannot at most walk their paths, save metaphorically on stilts, like the shepherds of the lands. He is accustomed to live cheek by jowl with Arcturus. A kite or a balloon he acknowledges, but no terrene mail service or horse car. Valleys and cellars distress him. He cannot lie on the grass of a summer's day to watch a colony of ants. He is of a loftier cast of mind, and sighs rather for the shining moats of the Milky Way, quote, scattered unregarded upon the floor of heaven, unquote. We have known him to refuse a June cherry, plucked only amidmost of the tree. What is such a bigot to do but thrust his tall head back, out of alien air, into his sixth-story arcade, where the muse sits waiting for him on a collapsing chair? Quote, Dans un grenier qu'on est bien et vingt ans. Unquote. So we have sought the heights and clove unto them in orthodox privacy, though lacking our just deserts of the aforesaid lady's favour. Yet do we in nothing reproach thee, iry of our youth, with thy beloved townish outlook and undusted shelves, save that the tutelary pages born of thee are scarce of so attic a flavour as our sense of the due sequence of things hath led us to desire. End of chapter 20 End of Goosequill Papers by Louise Imogen Guini